All right. It says that we are going. We are live currently. Um, let me double check that we actually are, since we're going through Streamyard. Um, still relatively new to this software, everybody. So uh, you know, give me just a second. It says that we are live. Nice. Okay. Um, so we are here to talk about all the craziness that has happened in the uh, in the last week. Um, to say the least, it has been uh, last few weeks. It, to say the least, it has been a wild ride. Um, the uh, um, the uh, we have quite a few things to discuss, but not only the insurrection, but also a report that came out on Martin Luther King Day of all things. Uh, to that is essentially what. Um, the Trump administration's final output. Up oh, there goes King. Um, he decided that he wants to sit on my legs, and that's kind of difficult with a uh, laptop in my lap. But you know, he he is uh, endlessly frustrating. If uh, if anything, not uh, if he is anything. Um, but um, to get back on topic, the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the report was um, the culmination of what we had previously discussed on here um, about the uh, the 1776 commission in which they uh, put out uh, what they foresaw as the proper way of teaching history. And so that is why we have reassembled the panel along with one extra person. So... Um, Let's uh, go around and introduce ourselves and introduce your panel. And and by the way, each person's um, each person's channel is linked directly below this video. Um, so be sure to go and subscribe to everyone. Um, so let's start off with you, Steve. All right, I'm Steve Heimler, and uh, I run a I run two channels. One is called Retrospect, where we put um historical or current events in historical context and another channel called heimler's history where uh i just help kids with their ap u.s history ap world history exams and uh that's about it glad to be here Ooh, on to sammy hi everybody uh, my name is Sammy. I run a channel called US 101. Um, I'm also a uh, high school history teacher in Chicago, Illinois. Um, as always, I'm honored and thrilled uh, to be with this panel. I can't wait for us to dive into this, guys. Oh, I've been reading this book for weeks, waiting for this panel to show up, and I can't wait to talk about myth and folklore of, uh, of the man of steel. At least I hope that's what we're talking about. Otherwise... <laughs> I have no idea why I'm here, <laughs> so, you know, no, but it's nice to see all of you and I'm excited to dive into this conversation. Looking forward to it. And go ahead. Hey there. I, I, my name is Mr. Beat and uh, my channel is Mr. Beat and I teach high school social studies, uh, American history, well, AP U.S. history and economics and U.S. government. So uh, it's been a very exciting year to teach, and uh, the 1776 Commission, I'm looking forward to that discussion, as well as the crazy historical events that have happened in the last few weeks. Thanks for having me. Hey, All right. Well, my name is Grant. I run the channel Casual Historian. I try to take niche or weird subjects and make them approachable for a casual audience. I, too, am looking forward to this uh, 1776 discussion. I might have a slightly different view than the rest of them, but we'll get to there when we get there. <laughs> and then I'm Emperor Tiger Star. I have a channel about history and maps, and I guess I'm technically a librarian, so there's that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're also a graduate student. <laughs> just, just kind of a graduate student then. <laughs> I, I'm only doing it for the healthcare. That's <laughs> so. Uh, that's the panel, and yes, as people are already pointing out, uh, what a diverse cast of white dudes. <laughs> um, 
That's all you who know, teach history is white dudes. So sorry. It is unfortunate, but that is that is kind of um, the American history profession on YouTube right now. I mean, we've uh, got apricot, we've got cream, we've got peach, we've got tan. <laughs> I mean, I, that's that's a variety of color. Oh, yeah. You've got follically challenged. You've got bearded dudes. You've got non-bearded dudes. You've got. I mean, I don't understand. What's diverse? That's right. All, <laughs> all, all depends how you define it. Right. <laughs> yes. Very um, game of uh, guess who. But it, it is an important <laughs> point that uh, we really do need to have uh, more diverse people teaching history on YouTube. Um, this is specifically that there. These uh, everyone here is an American. Um, could have we can actually put and um, focuses uh, on American history. Otherwise, we could have actually pulled in there. So, for instance, uh, uh, from from nowhere, I'm forgetting his name. the The name of the channel, from okay. nothing. From nothing. Um, um, and there there are a few uh, people that could be brought in in other discussions. Problem is when you narrow it down to Americans who focus on American history on YouTube, suddenly it's just a bunch of white guys. So that's a bit of a problem. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, but um, getting on to our first kind of, you know, setting of, of these, uh, of what, uh, of trying to deal with everything is we got to put some sort of label on it. That's one of the first things that you have to do. I know uh, I just, watched uh, uh, Steve's video recently on um, what happened on the 6th and uh, that's literally the first thing that uh, he talks about in there um, and it's it is the way that you have to um, set the framework for the entire discussion to come so what what, uh, what was that was it a siege was it an insurrection was it a coup was it any of those things and how does that uh reflect on the previous four years well i guess i'll go first uh i think obviously riot is the first word you want to go to because it clearly was riotous but was it a full-blown insurrection People are definitely making that argument, and I'm open to that argument. Of course, the legal arguments around that are always going to be a lot trickier. You know, like, did the president incite violence? Well, incitement is a very hard thing to prove con you know, concretely in court, since, you know, the uh, First Amendment has such high, uh, they place a very high value on it. And so you don't want to accidentally label things that aren't insurrection as insurrection. So definitely riot is the first word we should be using. We can add insurrection if we want. But that's going to be people who are more uh, knowledgeable about legal stuff than I. Well, I could say on uh, at least in terms of my take, uh, I am definitely using the word insurrection myself. Whoa! Uh, why did it just? <laughs> okay, uh, I uh, I am definitely um, in that. Camp uh, one because insurrection is actually not a uh, a legal term. While it has uh, it has use in law, um, you cannot um, incitement to insurrection is not actually a crime uh, that's prosecutable under the law. It's different for impeachment. Impeachment you can basically say whatever you want um, mm -hmm. as a crime, and you know then it comes to the Senate to actually convict, but um insurrection is seems to be purposefully left vague in american law um you go and read the insurrection act you go and read its amendment in uh, 1948 and uh, 62 or something like that at no point do they give a definition of any sort so it's it's actually pretty open to interpretation and i would definitely call that an insurrection uh because insurrections are also um obviously supposed to be something about challenging the government and when you're certifying an election that seems to be a pretty concrete uh challenge to the uh to that and by the way thank you uh lewis for the uh the um super chat uh he says hey cypher i'm just a brazilian history student and would like 
just to say that we're passing through the same problems here in Brazil, especially uh, in relation to uh, monarchist and dictatorial lovers here. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I'm not too familiar with uh, what's happening in Brazil, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it has been a weird thing. So, uh, who else wants to weigh in on... Um, yeah, I'll talk. The, I was going to add to what you were saying earlier about incitement and, and the Insur Insurrection Act. You're right. It is very vague and open to interpretation. And the Supreme Court has weighed in a little bit throughout history, but not a whole lot. I would say the closest we have is to like having an idea of whether or not what the president did you know, did he actually incite violence was uh, the, the Brandenburg test. Um, so uh, this basically the, the Brandenburg test is it's time for a Supreme Court brief. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, essentially, there's there's three parts to the Brandenburg test that the, they look at. They look at the intent to speak, the imminence of lawlessness and the likelihood of lawlessness, which I think the second two kind of go hand in hand. Um, but this is uh, based this is off of to incitement to riot. Right, right. Um, but this is based off of a case uh, called Brandenburg, Brandenburg v. Ohio. And so essentially there was a, a dude who was a KKK member who was uh, saying some some really, you know, it was hate speech, basically. Um, but he ultimately the ACLU stepped in on his side to say that the First Amendment did protect his right to say that because uh, he wasn't specifically inciting violence in that specific case. And there have been some cases after that, but always it's, a, you know, it's a uh, case by case basis, as they say. So I agree with uh, both of you, like both Cypher and uh, and Grant, because it's just like it's not as easy as you'd think to just like label it incitement to violence. <clears throat> Yeah, that's um, that's Cypher. You mentioned my video. Um, that's what I struggled to come to terms with uh, is what label to put on it, because in order to understand it, in order to talk about it, you do need the proper moniker to attach to it. And, um, you know, I it it seems like it comes down to two things. One, what did Donald Trump intend? And number two, what did the people think he intended? And um it's pretty clear from the reports that we've been hearing after the fact that um, not a few of them thought that they were called on by Donald Trump to go down to the Capitol and do what they did. Um, so it doesn't seem like coup is the right word. I mean, it's so often centered around a personality. And if he was trying to lead a coup, he did a really bad job because <laughs> he didn't... Um, he, he get, sent out all sorts of confusing messages um, and uh, told them to stand down, but kind of, but we love you, but maybe keep going. You know, it's very confusing. So, um, so insurrection is where I landed, but it's still, it's still fuzzy. I, I don't, I'm not sure from the evidence that I've seen that I can say what he intended and what he didn't. Yeah, that's, it's a, I wonder how much um, intent matters. Um, also say hello to everyone, to King Richard. Um, but uh, the, uh, the it's also an open question as to how much intention matters here. Because um, there is, for instance, there is a point in that speech that he gave that he was uh, very specifically said, like, um, to protest peacefully. He He actually did say that in the speech. But, you know, with all the rhetoric about fighting and then Giuliani's whole, you know, trial by comment, uh, combat comment and that, uh, you know, the intent doesn't seem to necessarily matter here. Um, and then how he handled it after that isn't uh, doesn't matter, doesn't seem to uh, matter for uh, seems to contradict it, I mean. Um, that especially that peaceful comment when he wasn't willing to like send troops and whatnot. Um, but I don't. We don't need to focus exactly on Trump himself and like his his uh, culpability in this. You know the the real question is uh, about the 
event itself, what do we label it? I'm kind of leaning towards like calling it like a putsch. Like not even for like comparisons to like Germany specifically, but just for the image of the fact that it's like a few thousand people attempting a violent overthrow, but it's not quite a military coup and it's not quite like a an all out insurrection. Maybe you have some sympathetic people within government like we've seen with the Capitol Hill siege, but like no official connections and stuff like that. And just the whole like small scale of it, things like that. So Butch just kind of comes to mind. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I'm just saying, like, you know, we, we're bandying words around riot, insurrection, putsch, potential coup, whatever it is. Um, the word I'm, I'm, I'm using is disgrace. The word I'm using is embarrassing. The word I'm using is atrocity. Um, call it what, call label it however you want. I know the media is, 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 is CNN, MSNBC, Fox, like they'll, they'll, they'll use words that, you know, will cater to their specific uh, viewer base. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it's, it's just, it's just embarrassing. That's, that's what it was. It was an embarrassment above all else. Uh, not only that, but it was a, tr it was a true 21st century American tragedy. I mean, like people went to the Capitol to f forcefully try to find politicians and I, I would imagine cause harm to them, considering that there were weapons in the crowd. They brought a gallows <laughs> to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. They're looking to hang the vice president of the United States. Uh, and the worst part about it is, I mean, it, the way we're going to look back on this in a year, five years, 10 years, I don't think there's ever going to be ever a consensus view on whether or not this was called an insurrection. I'm in the camp of that. It is an insurrection. This was a violent um, stance against an, an, an authority or a government. Um, that but is yeah, the, uh, traditional definition, but yeah, the, you no, know, it's not the legal definition because there is none, but yeah. And I wanted to answer uh, imagine Joey's uh, question. Um, do you all think insurrection is in the U.S. is possible? Not only is it possible, but w the Insurrection Act has been used exactly 27 times, uh, 23 times, sorry. Um, so not only is it possible, we actually have uh, quite a bit of uh, history on that. I'm working on an episode about that, by the way. Um, I'm but just wondering if maybe they meant the question what meant coup, maybe? Is that what they're really asking? Well, we've had we've actually had a successful coup in the United States in Wilmot, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, in yeah. 1898. Although uh, it was it, recorded as just a race riot. I was going to say, like, oh, yeah. I don't know if I even would call that a coup. I don't even. I think that's the wrong word. To, when I think a coup, I mean overthrow of government, and usually you have to have the military at least uh, to a certain degree on your side. So I, I just I think that word is also kind of misused. Uh, isn't like a military coup a type of coup though and just a common yeah. type but it doesn't necessarily and, need the military and as somebody pointed out in the comments already a unsuccessful coup is still a coup um okay. yeah. yeah and a coup is is a uh is a seizure of power um essentially but this wasn't necessarily going to be a seizure of power that's it actually doesn't really work as a as right. a coup power has um, to be recognized by like it, it's one thing to say hey everybody we're in control now but then for it to actually be carried out and enforced yeah that's although that's i mean like a, one type of coup is a push as uh as um tiger star already pointed out um it, which is technically a type of coup but uh normally thought of as kind of uh, i mean the classic example is the beer hall push in uh, 1923 um an unsuccessful coup that uh that um was an embarrassment and a disgrace to germany um but uh you know it also if we if we use that term puts it in a very different category because uh uh i am impeached for having a cat <laughs> apparently <laughs> 
Uh, I better resign before they find out I have one too. I mean, isn't that just like part of being a YouTuber? Um, <laughs> but uh, but the uh, um, if we use that term, because that's actually like further than just an insurrection. The push is like a uh, a, a legitimate attempt at a coup, um, and the uh, and um, that means that um, it would include. Um, uh, an actual attempt to seize power rather than to just, you know, assassinate people. Um, cause you know, they were chanting, hang Mike Pence and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but like, and it was during the certification of an election. So, you know, there, there's, there is degrees of this, but at the same time, if we t call it a push, then it's also drawing a very obvious parallel to 1923 Germany, which does not bode well for us a decade from now. I'll move to Canada by then. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, that's that's the question here: is this uh, like what do we label this, and um, and how much meaning goes into the label that we put on these things? Oh, I think the technical term is a clusterfuck. <laughs> You look at what was going on, all the, the various videos. It seems like no one really had an idea of exactly what was going on. At least there definitely wasn't an organized goal. You had some people coming in with zip ties, other people like literally storming the Capitol door and then staying behind the velvet ropes the whole time. <laughs> it's like clearly this is a mixed group of people. Not everyone was on board or knew what the plan was. Storming might be it, because I just checked Wikipedia, and they're officially calling it the storming of Capitol Hill. Well, because that's what makes for a really nice headline. Yeah, but, I mean, it, it just, Wikipedia tends to be very picky with labels like that. Like, it says, the storming of the United States Capitol was a riot and violent attack against yada, 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 yada. Yeah, they, they call it a riot. That's a distinction as well versus insurrection. So, we have yeah. a lot of chats better get to. Um, so, the, uh, well... I, as I have to say for the super chats, we are trying to have a, a panel, so you know it, the conversation has to flow naturally. So, um, if we don't get to your super chat, we're sorry. I will try to label it, put it on screen though, or um, just make your super chat better and pay him more money. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that too. <laughs> um, trying to help you out, kid. <laughs> uh, the uh, but the um. <laughs> So we're kind of in agreement that, that we can't really call it a coup exactly, and we can't exactly call it a push. So it's somewhere in between, and I think that in between is um, insurrection. So between riot and, and full-on coup um, is insurrection right in between. A coup with American characteristics. <laughs> Does it work I, the first time? I mean, it's. But it's also we've had a, we've had a lot of this kind of stuff in our history. Um, in terms of local government, it's exceedingly rare in terms of Congress, but it's actually not the first time Congress has been stormed. Uh, Congress was stormed in 1783 during the Philadelphia Line um, mutiny. So this actually has historical precedent in uh, U.S. history, but you have to go all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Um, but um, and in fact, the reason why DC exists in the first place was because of that Philadelphia Line um, controversy. Uh, because Phil uh, uh, Pennsylvania refused to intervene, and so Congress had to run away to New Jersey. Um, they set up shop in Princeton. Um, like if you look at like where the capital was from uh, from like. 1776 all the way, well, 1775 to, uh, to, uh, um, when, when did we get DC? Like 1801, something like that. Um, no, it's like 1798. Yeah. yeah. Cause Adams yeah, moved if, into the White you, House while they were finishing up. If you look at the, uh, where the Capitol was between those things, um, you will see that, um, there's a specific time where they just jumped to New Jersey and then right back to, uh, to Independence Hall or Liberty Hall, whatever that's called. Um, and uh, that's because they were attacked by a bunch of soldiers. Um, so, you know, it, this has happened before um, and actually far worse, but like uh, that wasn't 
this Capitol building, though. <laughs> but this Capitol building didn't exist yet. Um, of course, there was 1814, where, you know, a little bit worse. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say, like, to kind of to Grant's point, but also some of the commenters, um, I, there were, you know, there was confusion uh, from the people that actually stormed the Capitol. And I think the a very different part of this was the fact that there was, uh, we live in the age of mis information um, and disinformation even. So like we had people that were trying to coordinate and trying to get on the same page, but, but they couldn't get on the same page. And so we're so, I mean, this is also the age of fracture. So um, when we think about a unified front, <laughs> yes, uh, I suggest it as well. But uh, I think that we can't really realistically, I think, expect a unified front from, can, look how much, um, infighting there is with the the two major political parties and even third parties how much infighting there is i mean it, it's so difficult for everyone to get on the same page yeah i mean it's a uh, it's uh like and i guess we can say that like we don't have to have a label on it yet to to continue the discussion you know the the label is important but it also kind of dictates how we deal with it as teachers or as students. Um, you know, I, a good chunk of us are, are students or teachers here. And, um, and all of us, of course, are engaged in public history. And, you know, whether or not you call it a riot or a, an insurrection or a coup, um, you know, it does necessarily change our the way that we're going to be teaching, right? Um, it necessarily means that we're going to, uh, like, I know I've been referencing it constantly, and I've only had two sessions in my uh, in my U.S. history class, um, but it, it's like unavoidable. Um, so, how does it change how you guys teach? Um, speaking from my myself the day after um the storming of the capitol if we're going to stick with that headline uh i spent like my u.s history classes um literally just throwing out the lesson for that day whatever i was going to do and just spending time um listening to what the students had to say um because i felt that it was important to give them that space to be able to express their feelings on what they had seen on television and what they were feeling at that time and then trying to compare that incident at the capitol with what happened over the summer with the numerous blm protests and and uh the uh the uprisings happening in the streets across the country um and i think that for for teachers um and again, I can only I can only speak for myself, but I think it's moving forward in the years to come. It's going to be incredibly important to keep this part of our American history in the lesson, um, because this is just going to show students five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line, hopefully that we're removed enough at that point that we can say, hey, we lived in an era where misinformation and disinformation, like Matt was saying, um, was a true issue that we had to deal with, which led to you know, politicians literally fleeing for their lives in the Capitol building on the day that they were trying to certify an election. Um, so I think if nothing else, I think what it does for, for American history, in at least in high school, is it helps to put our history in a much sharper focus because this is the first time in our lifetimes that we have seen any attack on uh, a, a federal building uh, like this. And, uh, I think it helps put things into perspective in terms of like. So there, know. there are, there have been attacks on the federal building within our, uh, well, within your lifetime, not within, well, no, actually, I think within all of our lifetimes in uh, 1998, for instance, there was a mass shooting within the, well, an attempted mass shooting in, within the Capitol. Right. There's a thing um, in Oregon too, not, if, not too long ago. Uh, a, uh, uh, well, he did say federal building, so there's at least yeah. that qualifier. Well, well, I'm, I'm just talking about the capital. Um, 
you know, for instance, the uh, in 1954 there was uh, a uh, shooting from the gallery of right. the uh, of the house. They actually shot down into the house by a bunch yep. of uh, Puerto Rican nationalists. Um, so, um, you know, some of these things have happened. It's just it's it's the crowd element that seems to be the differentiator for me well the what, what's different for me and this is a big difference is this is the first time we've ever tried we've seen democracy directly under attack w what they were doing in the capitol that day was certifying the results of the election they were literally trying to overturn the results of an election and eat, some of them even chanting to to hang the vice president of the united states the guy who was facilitating the whole process that we take we, we used to take for granted you know like and it was supposed mm -hmm. to be ceremonial so i think that's what makes this you can't even compare it to these other things you're, you're you're bringing up i mean this is extraordinary this has never happened in american history and that's one thing i really stress with my students like i did not hide my true emotions like this is a big freaking deal and we need to make sure this never happens again mm -hmm. yeah i mean it this is, uh, I think that this is kind of one of those, uh, like, um, you know, like one of those uh, watershed moments for a generation, you know, where, like, I don't know about you guys, but that day I was just glued to the television, like, like it was 9-11 again, you know, like yep. the, uh, that, you know, I, I can, I'm pretty sure this is going to be one of those times that I remember when I was told. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I was rolling over in bed and I had a friend call me and be like, dude, look what's happening at the Capitol, man. <laughs> and like, that's going to be burned in my mind for decades to come. Um, much like, uh, you know, my generation, uh, millennials uh, remember 9-11 or uh, like Gen Xers remember like the Challenger disaster or, uh, or uh, boomers remember uh, JFK getting assassinated like it's it's one of those kinds of moments and that necessarily changes uh you know we've been talking about how it changes how we teach um so anybody else want to step in on that well I, I think it's interesting that because of the modern age how there's like more uh like literal visual perspectives on the event while it's happening too because like the challenger for example you always see that same footage of just like the rock going up and then and then blowing up because that was what was on TV. But, you know, if you went on Twitter or Twitch, there were people both nearby the event and at the event who were live streaming everything from different angles. You have people just taking selfies in one of the senator's offices as they're vandalizing it and stuff like that. Like things that, you, you know, normally would have just been covered by like just a CNN B shot role is now like able to be viewed from like 20,000 different perspectives. Well, I mean, yeah, the uh, the whole role of social media in this is going to be uh, is going to be something that like historians are definitely going to be tackling in the future. I mean, we are we're kind of in a place where we have an overload of information, but we also have an overload of misinformation, which triggered the event in the first place. Um, so it's. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely not like, because uh, with 9-11, everybody remembers seeing that same freaking footage of the pl uh, of the second tower getting hit over and over and over for like weeks. I remember that that same footage just playing on loop. Um, and this is different. Um, I, yeah, I don't know... Uh, I don't, I still, I'm having trouble parsing it myself. Yeah. So, uh, for a while now, I've been looking to try to do a, uh, a series of videos on the history of the American right. And this, this happened after my initial planning stages for it. And so I've had to recontextualize a lot of what I was going to do. And like one of the points I was going to be bringing up at some point during the series is that political violence when done on by the right tends to look differently than political violence on the left. Political violence on the left tends to be sporadic and chaotic and mostly attacks private citizens ultimately. And whenever you have right-wing political violence, it tends to be more lone wolf type actions and they tend to attack government targets. This instance was kind of a mix of the two 
where you have a mass crowd and it's sort of chaotic, but also attacking a government target. So it's kind of, it's a weird fusing of the two kinds of political violence we usually see. And that's something I'm still trying to come to grips with and find a way to make sense of when I eventually do getting around to making those videos. It is, it is a uh, mind-boggling question because it is. Uh, it's. I mean, it's something we have to take on as educators, though. Um, you know, it's. It's the. Uh, it's that moment where uh, suddenly it, uh, I remember with nine uh, eleven that uh, suddenly there was a lot of more focus in the history profession on um, acts of terror as, um, as you know, a uh, as like what do these do um whereas you know like at for instance uh there's a recent book that just came out uh, i think last year was uh called america's good terrorist and it's talking about john brown um and suddenly it like recontextualizes that term um even and, and like those kinds of acts and it's not like you can really avoid talking about like folks like john brown and uh you know terrorism in a u.s history class and um you know insurrections are kind of a a part of uh american history and a very important part uh and there's tons of them all over the place um so like does that uh does that actually end up entering your guys's lesson plans Well, not mine, um, <laughs> because we got we got a note uh, from our administration saying that we were not allowed to talk about it. Um, so, I mean, I'm in Atlanta, very very uh, north of Atlanta, very red um, area, and uh, so unfor unfortunately for them, I had already talked about it uh, after before they sent the the message. Uh, but uh, up to this, uh, so <clears throat> after this, you know. What am I gonna do? I got YouTube. Wait, so you're I, just so we're clear here. You're, that your administrator, they didn't let you talk about what happened, like just telling, talking about the the facts of what happened, or. Um, well, that yes, that that the the official line was no interpretation, um, but as as all How of you do know. You do it without Exactly. Is all you know. It, it even the choosing of what to say, what facts to present, is interpretation. So, yeah. I mean, there was a, a in our neighboring county. You know, you had to have a the kids had to have a permission slip, a signed permission slip to watch the inauguration. People, this is where I live. I promise you. I'm surprised that they didn't come up with like a, a script to give you to. The, so there were some a very upset people. Yeah. <laughs> That briskly walked in yeah. the same direction <laughs> all at once. Yes. Yep. In order to fill in the blank. Yeah. Take a trip, <laughs> that one guy did. Yeah. It was a tour in the Capitol building that just went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's the summer tagline for the movie. Oh, man. It, like... I can't wait to see the uh, the you uh, you guys have seen those uh, those textbooks where they refer to slaves as like uh, immigrant labor or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like there's going to be some of those in the future. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I don't even want to think about like the whole like like new. Uh, I already forgot the name. The Dunning School uh, is it Dunning School? Dunning that Bruce? Dunning yeah. School, that's yeah. uh, 1890s kind of uh, reconstruction was punitive. Yeah, I was thinking like it was wrong because of Dunning-Kruger effect, so I thought I was misremembering the name, but like, no, yeah, there's going to be a whole bunch of like Dunning School type history books in the next 50 years that we're probably going to deal with with this whole like past four to eight years, I'm sure, and it's going to be horrible. Well, that's, that's the homeschool movement, in my opinion. I think that's the, the what's leading the homeschool oh, no. movement more than anything is yeah. this, uh, like basically trying to give alternate um, histories of not like the alternate history, like we think of like alt history hub, like the fun stuff, but like literally completely giving a different 
um, alternate facts. Indoctr yeah, like indoctrination, essentially. I know, like, I have friends who were homeschooled, and it's not generally, I, it's, it's bad to make generalizations, I know, but um, from every, I, I, I guess, like, I've just noticed a pattern, I'll just put it that way, where a lot of what drives parents, um, what drives them to get their kids out of public school is that like, I don't like the, t the type of history that they're teaching, you know, or um, I don't like the way they teach government. That, seem that seems to be the, the number one thing followed by maybe science, like maybe there's like, oh, you, you teach evolution or something, you know? Yeah, evolution and sex ed, those were the two things that I remembered from a lot of like my friends who were homeschooled, that's what they would say. And, and all of a sudden, yeah. sorry to break in here. All of a sudden, I'm like, okay, now, now my, you know, administration. I, I've talked bad about them uh, publicly in front of all these people, <laughs> uh, but I wasn't trying to. It was there. I mean, I think it was coming from a good place. I, I, I understand what they were trying to do. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, they just they d didn't catch me in time. Mm. See what happened they was when Matt, to their Matt parents, was talking. Parents. Exactly. See, what happened was when Matt was talking, Steve got a ton of text blowing up his phone. He was like, oh, no. <laughs> Damage control. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to leave early, y'all. I got to <laughs> <gotta> go. <laughs> um, but uh, it does actually lead into uh, one of the topics that we wanted to talk about. Um, you know, it, this, this kind of like – because – I mean, this conspiracism has, uh, or conspiracy theoryism, um, conspiracism <laughs> need to dis differentiate between con being conspiratorial and conspiracist. Being conspiratorial is to actually engage in a conspiracy. Conspiracist is to theorize about conspiracies. Um, so, uh, this administration, uh, the last four years, has been fueled by a great deal of conspiracism. I mean, we've already had a few people mentioning QAnon in the uh, in the um, in the uh, um, comments here and everything, um, and how that kind of stuff is fueling people to to see, you know, they're not teaching the right history, uh, you know, that they're willing to deny history altogether. Um, and boy, did we see that on MLK Day. Uh, <laughs> so, what do you guys think this uh, 1776 report, uh, which I should probably preface it, this is the culmination of the, from what we had talked about in the previous thing of uh, Trump's whole patriotic education initiative. Um, what do you guys think uh, this r report? reveals like what is um like because we're talking about people who want to like avoid the history education offered in public schools and that like is this a view into their idea of american history the birch society was playing the long game with this one <laughs> yeah. i mean on, on on page one of the of the of, of the uh, pamphlet, we'll call it. Um, it says uh, that its declared purpose is to quote enable a rising generation to understand history and principles of the founding of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. So they're going to do that in twenty five pages, guys. Like that's that's how we educate the youth uh, moving forward to give them that patriotic, what Lendl Calder, the historian Lendl Calder called a glory story, quote unquote. Uh, we're gonna do it in 25 pages. We're just gonna gloss over chunks of history that don't necessarily fall into our, our, our patriotic vision of America, the, the type of story we're trying to present. Um, we're gonna provide you with, with no end notes, no footnotes, and uh, we're just gonna blatantly present a specific agenda while labeling everything that doesn't fall into that line as, as radical and, uh, and dangerous. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not good. And on top of that, if you wanted to introduce this thing into a curriculum, um, there are no lesson plans for this thing. There's only a couple of, uh, discussion based questions, which are all leaning in one particular direction. Um, yeah, if you were trying to teach this in a class, they're giving you like the pamphlet and then it's like, okay, now, you have to build a, an entire curriculum around the, uh, the, 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 the very, very thin amount of 
history that they're that they're trying to pass off as something that they want to instill in schools because it fills our students with patriotic fervor and uh, and hope. It's like it's like give me a give me a break. Yeah, I mean Trump was Trump said about it that it was there to you, know, you talked about the purpose of it um, there to clear away the twisted web of lies in our schools and classrooms and teach our children the magnificent truth about our country. And uh, and as you read it, you begin to see that these people who wrote it, who first of all, as, as you all know, were n not a single historian. Um, and you know, there the, was one who was a who was a avowed not white nationalist. Okay, <laughs> forgive me, forgive me. Boy. Um, but uh, you know, the the authors clearly see themselves as counter revolutionaries, um, and therefore according to what Trump said, according to what I read in this, um, this is an iconoclastic project. This is not a project of historical inquiry. Um, and the hammer they're using just happens for to the, be- uh, For the viewers, can you explain what iconoclastic means? Sure, yeah, like going into, you know, the, the, the literal um, definition would be to, you know, go into churches, smash um, icons, uh, the, the, objects of worship um, in order to break the the will of the people to worship um, so so that and, and so in this case the the tool they're using to to break these icons are is just is history instruction um, so I they're putting it forward as a historical project and yet they're not presenting it that way at all Yeah, I like for me, I, I've been seeing uh, this stuff uh, th uh, like I mean, this this seems like to me the last gasp of uh, of the culture wars from the 1980s and that like this. This has a lot of that kind of like, how dare you go after the founding fathers in any way? They are truly great men. You know, they might have been slave. Like, there's an entire section on slavery, and it's like, well, they might have been slaveholders, but everybody was a slaveholder, so that makes it okay. Um, and at one point, they even say that black people are the are the truly privileged people now because <laughs> affirmative action exists and stuff like that. Like, this this all seems like like it was written by Reagan in like 1996, at, a few years after he'd already been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, <laughs> Like it, it's like that level of just all over the place, and it seems to only remember uh, two specific time periods and just jumps between them willy nilly with no apparent reason. Like it, it talks about the founders, which you know is an entire generation, you know, but it talks about like the Declaration as if it's like the most sacrosanct document that like everything else follows from the U.S., even though it's not actually like law in any way um and they seem to have forgotten that the uh, first sentence in the uh, constitution literally talks about uh talks about uh welfare that you know d just uh, forget good chunks of the actual document that they're referencing and then they keep on jumping to uh to lincoln for some reason which I found extraordinarily confusing, but it kind of makes sense in terms of just like, I I see it as as that kind of of culture war stuff in like a and boiled down into like a fever dream. Dennis Prager in a really bad mood. <laughs> yeah, that's how those that's how those uh, essays right at the end was a uh, just a oh my God, compilation of Prager U videos. The, the appendices were terrible. I, I'm glad worst. I did read most. Of the, like I read like the intro and conclusion of a couple of them, and it was just no. <laughs> this is bad. Well, I, I got to be honest. I it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be because like we, when we talked about it beforehand, um, I just you know of course you just think of automatically indoctrination that word we we talked about in our last discussion. Um, when I actually read it. I was I was a little surprised that they had a little bit of like nuance in there, but I think to your your points all um, the the things that stuck out like the affirmative action thing was 
pretty wow striking but uh but also like their um their fetish with uh identity politics which uh mm -hmm. is something that has only been in the national uh dialogue really for i would say just a few years and so this shows you very how it's centric to like the zeitgeist now like it, it does like and then another thing i will add is like um when i say fetish with with I, maybe i should use a different word but, but just the focus on that and the focus on like you were saying cypher um the founding fathers this the founding fathers that oh well yeah we might mention lincoln or martin luther king jr or frederick Douglass, just so we don't only like praise slave holders but yeah um that's totally uh that's like that's a fallacy that's argument from authority um and so if you're talking like a lot of the uh the six or the 1776 um commission is all about idealism like what we want to be and yet it consistently contradicts itself when it says oh yeah but you know back then things weren't so bad and so we shouldn't like look at the flaws of the past i mean so it completely is uneven because of that yeah that that argument of authority thing i'm gonna definitely touch on because like that's um that's uh like it makes it real obvious one that there that there's no actual historian working on this stuff because like you use quotes as evidence not as um you know uh just kind of flavor text that you know comes from on high um but also i wanted to to read the, like we've mentioned the the whole uh you know black that uh that they're against affirmative action and they call that privilege. I wanted to read that section just real quick. Um, so it's on, oh, it's on we... page 16 and um, they say, today, far from a regime of equal natural, uh, equal natural rights for equal citizens enforced by the equal application of the law, we have moved toward a system of explicit privilege that in the name of, quote, social justice, unquote, demands the equal results and explicitly sorts citizens into, quote, protected classes, unquote, based on race and other demographic categories. So they're basically saying that affirmative action grants privilege, um, which... Whew. That's a that's a hot take. <laughs> so, it's 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 just it's just it's just garbage. Like let's 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 just call a spade a spade, ladies and gentlemen. This is like I mean, this is the same document where they list the progressivism as one of America's problems that they've had to overcome. Yeah, and right after I, slavery. Yes, so slavery, then progress or progressivism, oh, and this, yeah. I, and this idea that yeah, yeah, progressivism as like a like a and challenge they say that, to America, uh, uh, and they keep on talking about these group rights things, like group rights, and this idea that first of all, I, I also love quick tangent. I love that they're taking John C. Calhoun, like a noted dickhead in American history. And what they're doing is they're making sure that they equate him with identity politics, therefore yeah. making sure they put him on the side of the left saying, y'all are just like John C. Calhoun. We're <laughs> not like Calhoun. You are the good guys. You guys are the pricks. Like it's, and I'm just like, how, how are you equating a slave owner who wanted like zero equality across the board with, um, people that tend to focus a bit more, uh, their, po their politics a bit more on the left, but it, when they say progressivism, I mean, there's like little keywords that they drop in, in this document. Like they say progressivism at the top. They say it's American, quote unquote, elites who bring about progressivism. When we're talking about elites today in 21st century um, vernacular, in, in political vernacular, we, we tend to be talking about who are the elites, the people that live on the coast, right? New York, L.A., big cities, um, blue state Democrats, whomever, these are the people that are considered the elites. And it is these elites that are bringing about this social justice, this, this, this sense of privilege uh, versus an overall uh, umbrella idea of equality that the founders wanted. Um, I mean, th there's just so many little calls out to people that already have or will tend to have a more uh, 
right wing view of of their politics. And this is this is for them. Ultimately, this is for people, which I mean, look, if this is how you think on your own already, that's fine. But there's no reason to want to create an entire document and then ultimately try to build it out into a larger curriculum and lesson plan that you want to put in every single school across the country. Because here's the thing. If Trump had won, that's what the, that's what this would have been. It would have been tried to have been pushed as actual curriculum into all the schools, complete with these. Uh, I mean, shall we call them dog whistles? There's a number of dog whistles in there. That Except like, these whistles, you can actually hear the notes. So <laughs> the more like normal whistles at this point. I mean, I, I do want to point out something with uh, Sammy here. Um, you know, this this is a, a document that just fetishizes the uh, the founding fathers and everything and, and their words and everything. And I just want to point out, like, what's on your forearm there. Uh, oh, that one. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not like the people on this panel are are opposed to this stuff, and yet that's what they make us explicitly out to be. Matt said something interesting. He said earlier, "This is a document that he appreciate. He kind of appreciated the, uh, I'll, I'll grant it, nuance in this document. Um, I don't personally see anything nuanced about it, other than like if you're eh, never mind. Anyway." Um, he did say, though, that this is a document and this is a, a lesson that basically wants to show that this is what America uh, could be. Right. I, I would say thanks Oh, that, uh, uh, to Ed Mahara's. I'm guessing I'm saying that right. Thank you, Ed. Um, oh, fifty dollars. That see, guys, pony up. That's what we're talking <laughs> about. Here. Well, that's MX. What's MX? I don't know. Oh, it's probably Mexican peso, pesos. Um, but whatever, whatever. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 50 bucks is 50 bucks. So they, um, but listen, um, no, what, what, Matt, the <laughs> what Matt said was something about like how, again, this document is something that this is what America could be. I would slightly go against that. And I would say that the, the authors of this document, these non-historian authors of this document are creating this document so that it's about what America should be in their mind. This isn't what like America could be. This isn't, um, oh, the big melting pot of equality where everyone gets a big hug at the end of the day because we're all citizens who love each other. No, this is what America should be in their minds. This is the idea of America according to a select number of people who have a preferred vision of what the United States should be. And this is what they want to present. It's not about presenting specifically like, oh, this is what we should strive to achieve for that, that idea of American exceptionalism. But it's more about let's take it back to the era of the founders when black people were slaves, when Native Americans were completely ignored. There's not one mention of Native Americans in this entire document, by the way. Not a one. Oh, yeah. That's I was surprised. Like they spend an entire section on slavery, but not colonial settler. Uh, settler. Well, Settler well, they, colonialism. There was that one reference to westward expansion into the untamed wilderness. Or un ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, they were just there and then they just mysteriously well, disappeared like Roanoke, you yeah, know? Right. <laughs> you know just, this kind of rhetoric does have a lot of historical precedent though. Like that yeah. that is how uh, the orthodoxy uh the you know or orthodox historians um, generally saw um, the West, that like Indians were no better than the land that they were upon, that they were wild and needed to be tamed. That's why they would uh, uh, often unflinchingly use the word savage. Um, savage is to, uh, to equate them with savage lands, um, you know, to literally equate them with the land. So conquering empty territory isn't just, uh, isn't a uh, contradiction in terms to them. They see Indians as part of the territory, and therefore it is empty to civilization. Are, there, are you saying that these are people who wrote this document, that they read the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Frederick Turner idea of what, the, of what the frontier is and then just stopped? <laughs> they're, like, they're like, nope, this is good. <laughs> There's no need to go any further than this. Considering the average age of these people, they probably grew up on that. So, right. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's, that was a powerful concept 
it was a powerful concept in um, in uh, American history well into the 1960s. Um, it was really not until uh, that point that you'd see people finally moving away but, uh, from that, but it is precisely that move away from uh, orthodox history, from nationalist history, that uh, that these people are complaining about. I mean, they're doing it less intellectually, uh, obviously. They're not, you know, uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. or anybody like that. They, they're certainly not capable of that kind of, of deep thought. Um, but they are certainly using the same um, political bent, just with a little, uh, with quite a bit less finesse. Yeah. So when I read the document, one I don't read as many uh, dog whistles into it as some of you guys do. Some people see dog whistles. I just see some antiquated verbiage. But when I was reading it, I mostly it mostly just felt like a very sloppy Tea Party era book basically and when i was reading it i reminded a lot of like uh, this book i have here uh the five thousand year leap from cleon scouse and that's what it was kind of reminding me of like this would not sound out of place in a 2009 glenn beck monologue basically <laughs> <laughs> you wrote this whole thing on the chalkboard i mean that's not exactly a point in its favor though <laughs> um the uh um and uh thank you crafty mom oh it's crafty mom uh She's been on uh, on. She, she's been uh, along the entire way of me reading in uh, live on Twitch. Um, <laughs> oh, so, uh, that's, that's so I think she's uh, glutton for punishment. <laughs> that was that was very hard to read. Um, and while we can debate about like how many dog whistles are in here or if they count as that. Um, you know, the antiquated language um, should be an indicator of something. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the fact that we're talking antiquated language for, for for 40 or 50 years ago, you know, that this is was considered antiquated uh, half a century ago. You know, that should be an indicator. But I also think that um, it's also an indicator of how our society has changed. Um, and this is kind of leading into a, another large question um, to tackle uh, is, you know, not, uh, we're talking about like how this is kind of revealing of a particular ideology in that. But, uh, you know, I know you, some of you guys sent me messages like, are we even going to have this now that Biden's <laughs> inaugurated? <laughs> um, because like, um, you know, there is this kind of sense that Biden is is a uh, turn away from this. But is it really? Or, or are we just, uh, you know, by having it delete, having this report deleted off of the White House's website, are we just patching over a problem that's going to fester and come to the surface again? I don't think it's going to be as big as problem in the future because we live in the information age and misinformation age and i think i still maybe call me naive call me you know idealistic but <clears throat> i think that the truth still ends up pushing through ahead and and you just can't i mean so many people that i know that have read this document just easily see th right through it i mean the document says that you should literally we should almost exclusively read primary sources how out of touch is that like oh we're just going to ignore all secondary sources when we study history like it i i think uh which that, primary sources too <laughs> yeah like I, I mean i think uh the reaction to it i think is revealing because especially a lot of younger people as well that are already understanding that you just can't be yes to us as easily as you used to be able to and you know when the prussians first decided to have um mandatory public schooling every kid has to be in school it was primarily for the cause of nationalism and for um essentially making good citizens and good workers as well um i mean don't deny that's a big part of why we still to this day the, the legacy of that is why we still have public schools today um and i think this is some, something that's trying to get back to that desperately it's just it's just 
it's too late. I'm so sorry. Like it's the cat's out of the bag. Like uh, we are smarter than ever before. We, we have access to information instantly. You can't like you, you there, there are, the gatekeepers literally have no influence. And again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. When we live in the age of fracture, that's a big reason why is because of how information now is so easily accessible. I mean, how can they really expect, even if they, okay, let's say uh, Trump did get reelected and then they were to try to implement this. You really think that this would have been successful in the classroom? Do any of you think this would have been successful at recreating curriculums in a way that would influence an entire generation to be like, oh yeah, no, America exceptionalism is the way, you know, I, I just don't think it would have worked even if it wasn't tr implemented. You know what? It might not have it might not have worked, but you know damn well that there would have been a ton of teachers that would have done everything in their power to make sure that this thing had legs. And uh, it's funny you brought up that primary source section because I read that too, and I immediately like put my head through a wall. I'm like, okay, how does one just read a primary source without any sort of context behind it, though? Like, are you just reading the primary source to say, "Ooh, look at the flowery language of the 18th and 19th century"? Like, what what is the? You can't give students a primary source from 100, 200 years ago without supplying them with some sort of context. And that's where the secondary source comes in because the secondary source is there to also give you nuance to, 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 what, the sec to what the primary source is saying. And the secondary source is there to give you the different perspectives on what that primary document means. So by just having students read a primary document to say, oh, look, I read this, I read this letter or I read this bill of sale or I read what, what is the point of that though? Like, what, what are you trying to, what is the skill set that you're trying to teach these kids other than I found this old piece of paper? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, well, there, yeah, and especially, is, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, no, and especially since the, the report itself was presenting an interpretive framework, uh, for primary documents. So yeah, read them, but read them this way. Um, and you know, that, that reminded me of, um, something I'd read, um, David Armitage, Armitage, uh, his book on the declaration of independence. Like they are, they love the declaration of independence in this, in the 1776 report. And it's very clear to them that this was a document intended to set forth the the political and moral and sort of spiritual principles that America was founded on. But what Armitage argues in his book to me very convincingly is that the Declaration of Independence was a was nothing like that in the slightest. It was a foreign policy document. It was there to say to the world, look, we're not under British rule any longer. We're taking our place on the stage of nations. Um, and you know, all the enlightenment principles that we see in that, in that second paragraph, those are, those would not have been revolutionary. Like everybody in Britain agreed with those. Um, so, I mean, I've got quotes from Jefferson and Adams. I would like to point out something on that actually. Um, there, so there's been a lot of, uh, work on what's called, um, Atlantic history now. Um, that's especially looking at, uh, the kind of, uh, the, uh, cross-Atlantic ties of the revolution um, and how like the revolution spread and that kind of stuff. It's like a whole, it's a whole uh, field of study. Um, and it tends to focus on either the early Republic or right before it. And all of it uh, tends to point out that uh, the, that language in the second paragraph was actually kind of counter-revolutionary um, that, uh, there was this growing idea of what was called, well, still is called positive rights. Um, and positive rights were, uh, you know, that the idea that uh, a government, that rights are created are um, by people. Uh, and this was a reversal of that and a hard reversal because, uh, because the uh, revolution was so successful here, it spread, and that language of natural rights spread with it. Um, and so, actually, natural rights was on the way out. Uh, it was considered old um, at the time. You know, you could find Rousseau railing against the idea. Um, 
despite the fact that like people quote Rousseau for being like a founder of natural rights, he was actually very much opposed to it. Um, and so th this is uh, this is the kind of thing that like it shows that like just reading the primary sources like completely lacks. And this is a really new field of study. Um, and like we're kind of coming to terms with the with how intellectual influence worked. And rights time. are made up. George Carlin was right. Rights are made up. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a that's a f philosophical debate. But, <laughs> yeah. You know the the uh, the point being that um, that um, it wasn't something that everybody would have just agreed on. It was um, actually kind of counter to the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, people talk about these as Enlightenment principles, but in fact, this was kind of a regression to like the 17th century Enlightenment rather than the 18th century. So. Jefferson in that regard was actually kind of a century behind, but you know, he was also a century behind in a number of other ways. Well, yeah, that, that point I concede. Um, but Jefferson himself certainly, um, viewed the declaration as the, as, as what I said, the, the political document. I, I mean, uh, he wrote a letter to Henry Lee in 1825, where he said the object of the declaration of independence, that, uh, when, when forced, therefore, to resort to arms for redress and appeal to the tribunal of the world was deemed proper for our jurisdiction, this was the object of the Declaration of Independence. Not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, but to place our plight essentially before the world. So that's that's all I was trying to say. Yeah, I mean, I, that's uh, that, and that was very much what the the first paragraph is, what most people seem to forget um, but the first paragraph is making a, out a very like legalistic argument. Um, but and no point in this document in the 1776 report do they actually analyze the the Declaration, let alone the Constitution. At no point do they give any kind of interpretive value other than this is cool. Because that would involve research. So, in other words, if we actually followed what they wanted and only looked at those primary sources, then their whole argument falls apart just immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I also say there's a point because <laughs> they don't they not only focus a lot on the Declaration, but the Constitution gets a lot of love in this mm -hmm. thing, because this clearly is written by people who are like seem to be through and through originalists. Oh, there's um, a bunch of constitutional scholars. Um who, who uh, are like constitutional lawyers who wrote this. There's, oh. like, there's like 25 people who wrote this, by the way. Right. No, no, no. Yeah. But I mean, like the, the best part about it, there, there's a section in the, in, in uh, the progressivism section where they, where they basically say that the progressives ultimately are trying to, to create this quote unquote new theory that the constitution is a living document. And yeah. I'm just like, let's. Well, that's actually the thing that I got. I got really angry on stream when they said that because uh, guess where that quote comes from? The living document. Isn't that like what Jefferson said? No. Well, Jefferson wasn't involved in the uh, writing of the Constitution. Oh, yeah, um, that's right. But probably the biggest figure in writing the Constitution and also promoting it Um and they also, uh, he apparently can rap somewhat good. Oh, a ham. Yep. The Alexander Holman. Hamilton. That's a quote of Alexander Hamilton that they took out of context and freaking just, just acted like, you know, it was some, it was like Teddy Roosevelt or something, or, or at one point they quote Carl Becker completely out of context. And it's like, like you guys don't like uh, I. You guys know enough to quote <laughs> Carl Becker, but you don't know enough to actually like do him any kind of justice. And there's lots of love for the Federalist Papers, which I would argue already are attacking originalism. It's the first interpretations of the first few years after the Constitution is ratified, and the Federalist Papers literally are already reinterpreting the document that just passed and. Oh yeah. And not only that, they don't even mention the anti-federalist uh, perspective right. at all. Like, hello, that's a whole other faction that. You and you're basically answering Jeremiah's question right there. Like, 
what's a good way of interpreting it? The same way the Supreme Court does. With yeah, the federal that's what when I teach U.S. government to my students, uh, one of the most common uh, lessons that I incorporate uh, are lessons where they pretend to be Supreme Court justices and say, OK, we've got uh, the Constitution in front of us. We also have precedents. We also have um, a bunch of, you know, uh, essentially like interpretations outside of uh, that you could that you could they can influence you. But, reg- you know, it's. It's the what if situation, and you this is very on brand, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think it, you know, that way of doing it makes it so that it forces them to uh, critically think about it, and as as opposed to just like, okay, this is what happened, and then this is what happened, and the, and also it's also it's a frankly a more rewarding way to learn history when you know you you empower the the students that way, right. <clears throat> It just it just it just blew my mind though that they're they're having this issue with the idea that the Constitution is a living document, <laughs> despite oh. the fact that we've been adding amendments since the 1990s. And here's yeah, one more thing. That's the whole point. <laughs> I'm gonna say something. I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be. That's where the quote comes from. That's, That's literally yeah. the, like Hamilton. It's it's like Federalist Paper, like number. It's like the one right after uh, John Jay wrote his first one. Because you wrote, memorize the Federalist Papers. Come on. <laughs> you can get a copy in Barnes and Noble for like seven dollars as a pocket edition. Oh, I could, have... go, I could go grab my copy, and it's leather bound. So, ha! Uh, but... <laughs> he, he, he bought his from Costco. All right. <laughs> well, Barnes and Noble, but you know. Okay. All right. It, the 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 Costco ones are actually an imprint from Barnes and Noble, um, and they're only twenty five bucks. They're great. <laughs> uh, anyways. <laughs> I have I have like a whole shelf of leather bounds. I love them. Um, but it <laughs> looks <yeah>. like mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but whatever the one uh, right after John Jay wrote his first one, it's like three. You know, um, he specifically talks about how amendments can um, make the document a living document, um, and like, and that's what it's like. You guys have quoted the Federalist Papers twice. I, I think there was at least twice that they quoted them. And yet somehow accidentally quote this point as if, like, these progressives are, you know, completely ruining the founders' vision. It's like... Are we really no. calling this an accident, though? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all... <laughs> I mean, considering they're they're already literally stating their purpose is to indoctrinate a certain point of view, it only makes sense that they're going to be very selective with what they're choosing to teach. Yeah. And, and sure gonna, not that, like this whole movement um, we've seen since basically, uh, I would say, the, the early 1980s of, you know, this uh, originalism essentially trying to get to that. Um, there are no originalists. Even Antonin Scalia, he may have called himself an originist, originalist, but... Hot take, no, he wasn't. And I'm saying that as somebody who I greatly respected Antonin Scalia. In fact, like uh, a lot of people are going to hate me right now when I say this, but I think, Ew. yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I knew Emperor Tiger Star would hate me. But uh, <laughs> I think he actually, when you read a lot of his opinions, I'm just like shaking my head. Yeah, this guy makes sense. But when he calls himself an originalist, I just think that's so misleading and so like, um, maybe he's just trying to, I mean, I, I get like the, the push to kind of, revert back to um well and his his point was always like okay if you want to move forward you should change the constitution you should amend it you know like thomas jefferson said the every uh once in every generation you should scrap the constitution and start over he wrote that in a letter to james madison um well you know it's not easy to amend the constitution that's the reality we live in so we've had to depend on the supreme court for so, so long to you know uh, re- make reforms. So that's the dilemma. The worst part is, is that when they say about the idea of the living document is that progressives want to change the constitution into a living document because they feel that they need to update the quote software. Oh my God. Of the country <laughs> as if he, as, let me, okay. These people clearly don't know how long fucking computer works you have to update the software and the hardware otherwise the thing is going to die 
it doesn't last forever. If you update it and keep your, you know, your operating system up to date, keep your battery up to date, keep everything, the computer will continue to live. But apparently, according to these people, is all we have to worry about uh, are the First Amendment, specifically the freedom of religion, and the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. After that, anything else that you add to this thing is complete gobbledygook because it makes it a living document and doesn't stick to our true original ideals. This is the, like, one of the, you don't even have to love history to look at this thing and go, something's awry. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something that's just not adding up with all of these, you know, uh, hypocritical and contradictory statements that are happening literally one paragraph after another. It's unreal that they would try to present this off to people and have it make sense. Ten killer apps of American civilization. <laughs> Oh, dude, like it, it, it has such a freaking air of like, hello, my fellow kids. Um, <laughs> like the, the, uh, there's another part where it talks about the power cord of the cons of, uh, of the Republic or something like that. Power <laughs> cords are pretty cool. <laughs> it, it, it like, I'm able to make like, like epic notes on a guitar with is, only two fingers. How I mean, is, it saves how a lot of work. How is this a representation of the Constitution? <laughs> and what that actually represents is it's a conduit, you see, from the federal government uh, to the states, thus proving that we actually indeed live in a federalist society by sharing. Go I'm making it up as I go. Listen. Um, and also the number of times that they say, like, true American, true virtues, true whatever, that they, they're constantly saying, uh, like, and they're constantly saying that the uh, that there are these true things that they have somehow inter interpreted, and everyone else is wrong. If they if they say otherwise, they're not true Americans. They actually use the word un-American in here multiple points, um, and I think that's another thing that's quite revealing. But it's it's more revealing of a a a long-standing issue that uh you know we we've been talking mostly about just making fun of the i mean there's a lot to make fun of and we can go over just how bad this thing is for hours upon hours but um you know maybe we could talk about uh, neoliberalism neoconservatism uh, which are not opposing things people seem to think that like neoliberalism is the new left Neoliberalism is an economic ideology. Neoconservatism is a social and cultural um, ideology in reaction to the new left. Um, but a lot of the new left today is, in fact, uh, neoliberals. Uh, and all, all neoconservatism, uh, neoconservatives are neoliberals. I can't think of any neocon, neocon that isn't a neoliberal. And I think that a lot of that ideology is being revealed here. Um, especially when you're talking about like true Americans, true uh, American virtues, true X, Y, and Z, while still trying to update the language with this this very wonky killer apps kind of stuff. Man, you know, they're focusing a lot on identity politics there, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't want to give my hand away uh, too quickly, but I think it does show something about these like overarching ideologies that we've been steadily turning to the right uh, since the uh, 1980s. Well, 1978-ish. Somebody mentioned in the chat the no true Scotsman fallacy. Yep, that's it. That's... Yep. Um, but in terms of what this shows about uh, like where we are going as a country... Ooh, big question. That is, uh... Should we go down the line? Who wants to go first? An <laughs> Onion article. <laughs> <laughs> Can somebody pull something up on JSTOR to answer this one, please? Uh, Onion seems to have, like, just, like... We're we're at a point where the, like, Onion and the Battle Babylon B are, like, just, like, the news, but, like, two years ahead. Well, I think I, I would just I'm not going to say a lot here. I'm just going to say that I I don't think it's going to be magically better anytime soon. Um, you know, we have a lot of deep division 
I would argue that um, we haven't been this divided as a country since the American Civil War era, I would say, um, you know, in terms of like literally people um, that are completely um, like in their own bubble and own reality, which is a whole new level, which you you didn't see in previous eras with, you know, the fact that we can just kind of cocoon ourselves with it information that we only want to see. And so I think that, um, you know, it is, it is troubling to see like a giant company like Twitter or Facebook censoring, um, and, and suspending accounts and stuff like that. At the same time, like what united many Americans before was, um, all sharing a common truth, like agreeing on facts and then disagreeing about how to, uh, make changes to society <laughs> based on facts where, we have to get to a point where we we uh, agree on facts again, and I think um, it may take a couple decades for that to happen. I, I still think we're in the adolescent phase of the internet. Um, I think a lot of folks that grew up with the internet, um, they're fine. They really are. But I think um, older generations are still trying to. Um, like a great example is the uh, the QAnon uh, folks that. Um, it reminds me of myself when I was in high school, first discovering the internet. Like I went to like, I think one of the first sites I went to was like a Bigfoot website. Um, and then a UFO went after that, you know, it's like, that's where I, and I, I don't mean to like put any, any of these folks down. Um, I just understand like how easy it is to be manipulated. And so once we get past that, the, the disinformation, misinformation, then I, I really think that, we're going to see um, another period similar, more similar to uh, the latter half of the 20th century, where most Americans, uh, you know, did share most values. I, I went I mean, on for too long. Sorry. I, I mean, you you want to hope that this period in American history, like of where we have these very stark divisions between each other does not last too long um because then you start to see divisions uh of the, divisions in the american fabric at the micro level never mind the macro never mind like red state blue state we're looking at like you know uh, families that sit across the table from each other mm -hmm. are literally not talking to each other anymore because of Somebody read one website and somebody read another website. I, I I love and appreciate the fact that as we continue to progress forward as a nation and as a people, innovations continue to pop up, which allow us to gain access to more information, um, allows us to get to 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 transmit information faster in, in more efficient ways. The issue then, again, becomes. People that will manipulate this new technology, manipulate these new systems that we have in place to transmit all this amazing information that we have and manipulate it so that people start to think in, in, in a completely different way. That is what we saw is like even five years ago out of the realm of possibility. And, and, and you want to hope that like after a while, like people start to eventually just calm down and people recognize that like, oh, this, this, this QAnon person or whoever it is, it's just a dude in, in somebody's basement that's just making it up as he goes, probably waking up and going, OK, let's tell the people this and see how they react. You want to hope after a while that eventually the fervor calms down to where people's the veneer is removed off of people's eyes and people go, oh, geez, like what? That really got out of hand fast, right? Like, but I mean, yeah. that's the, that's the name of the stream, actually. And you can thank Grant for that. That that, that was yeah. Grant's idea. <laughs> oh, nice. But I mean, really, like at the end of the day, like the goal, like Matt said, is to for us to ultimately try to come together and recognize that there is that there is an actual truth to things, that there are actual facts to things. Whether we agree or disagree on certain things, of course, that's always going to be allowed. That's the basis of a democracy, the idea of having debate and discussion. That's the beauty of where we live. But to completely come to the table with that set of alternate facts and to not be open to the idea that the facts that you have been presented were just 
drawn up out of thin air, that's where the real danger lies. Because now you're just building complete alternate realities that you're just going to bubble yourself into and close yourself in. And despite how much research or how much information or how much truth or how much facts are actually thrown at you, there are people that are legitimately going to be like, nope, I stand by what I stand and you can't tell me otherwise because freedom of free, freedom of thought and, and, and so on and so forth. It's scary, man. Just wait until deep fakes get better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but there's also, um, in terms of, uh, you know, being in uh, completely different realities and that, you know, it, you were talking about like how we, we can disagree, but you can't come to the table like that. We, we have a word for that. Um, the word is bigotry. Um, you know, the the uh, for instance, let's just go straight to the definition because everybody seems to get the definition wrong. Uh, or bigotry is the um, obstinate or unreasonable attachment to a belief, opinion, or fa faction, in particular prejudice against a person or people on the basis of their membership or particular group. Um, so. Um, you know, what you're talking about there, you know, this, this kind of, uh, you can't actually argue, um, if you're being bigoted, like it's not a, uh, it is not an argument at that point. Bigotry is not an argument. Um, so you can't actually disagree and be bigoted at the same time. Um, and I, I definitely think that this, uh, this document represents a, colossal amount of bigotry um and also reveals a great deal about the presidency um but uh do you think that that's something new or is it you know kind of something that we've been headed towards for like you know a century or 10 years whatever i mean i was only kind of partially joking about the john birch society this does feel like something that's like been on its way for the past like 50 years it's just gotten more blunt to the point this time when the yeah. john birch society though was created it was we had three channels that reported the news i think the difference remains the the fact that we're in the information age where it's so easily easy just to have an alternate reality and you mentioned deep fakes <laughs> you're right like the I, Somebody in the chat mentioned, should we bring back the fairness doctrine? I don't think that would solve it. I think the key is media literacy, like teaching uh, people how to analyze how they get their information. Yeah, let's not forget that the that tobacco companies use the fairness doctrine to so um, uh, doubt on the pretty conclusive evidence that smoking was linked to lung cancer. It was, I mean. I'm sure the fairness doctrine did some good things too, but it can, it's not the, it's not the panacea that I think people think it is. Yeah. It wouldn't I'd work like for the modern the, times. Yeah. I'd also like to point out the fairness doctrine only uh, applies to things that go over uh, public airwaves. Um, that's the reason why the um, government had any right to regulate it because it was going yeah. over public airwaves. Um, but uh, you know, cable, doesn't matter and internet anything on the internet would not be able to re be regulated by the fairness doctrine uh, that would be an explicit violation of the first amendment um so it's super weird and but then you also have things that you know while obviously not a violation of the first amendment with like removing trump and all his uh uh all the QAnon stuff twitter and that um that's not actually a violation of the First Amendment, uh, but you could say that's a violation of freedom of speech in general. Just like it's it, at that point, you're arguing about like the idea of freedom of speech um, rather than an actual legal argument. And um, but uh, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> what you're saying is we need a public social media website. Oh, Lord, no. A BBC <laughs> Twitter type thing for everyone to use. <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> no one can get kicked of off of that one, but everywhere else is fair game. I yeah. think uh, I'm noticing in the chat a lot of people like talking trash about the media. and uh, They're using the media to talk trash about the media. I'm so like, 
It blows my mind. We, hey guys, we're all the media now. It's us. Okay. Well, like it's it's like when they say something oh. has chemicals in it. It's like, yes, yeah. everything has chemicals. In it. Exactly. <laughs> like, and that's where that media literacy idea comes in, like you were talking yes. about earlier. Like it's this idea of like, guys, media is not just ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, ESPN. It's not what's on your television. There's also PBS. Oh yeah, well, that, I mean, they're great. But I mean, <laughs> I love PBS. Ken Burns is my boy. But I mean, um, no, but like this is media. We are we are broadcasting to you from our homes right now, and you are able to watch us in real time discuss something, and you are able to interact with us. This is media. Mm -hmm. Newspaper is media. Blogs are media. Twitter is media. Facebook is media. Everything is media. Mm -hmm. And this idea of understanding that and, and recognizing that everything that we do now or most everything that we're interacting with online or however else is an extension of, of, of media. And recognizing that is, I think, a first step in understanding like how to interact with others moving forward. Yeah, well. And I also want to say that, uh, like, while we're talking about, like, because I think there's kind of a tendency, uh, well, I've called it technotheism, that uh, that people have this tendency to, to fetishize technology within history, that, you know, all, things only happen because of some there was some sort of technological advancement, and um, that's, that's the driver of history. Um, and there's this, there's just so much that uh, predates the internet in terms of this polarization that we have. Um, like I'm currently writing a series on this and like the first episode ends in like the sixties um, and the next two will not get into the two thousands. Well, I mean, they will, but like barely, they're more focused on like the seventies and eighties as points of divergence so the internet isn't like it is important in terms of talking about like filter bubbles and that kind of stuff but at the same time there's something more fundamental here um this ideology comes from somewhere not just that there is something driving us to become even more polarized but there is that polarization existing prior to the internet in the first place mm -hmm. yeah so I think one thing that we definitely should be doing or institutions need to be doing is sort of repairing their reputation because fact of the matter is one of the reasons people are going to these alternative sources for news is that some of the more traditional sources have sort of besmirched themselves to one degree or another. Government, media, other public and private institutions have all sort of lent themselves easily to mistrust from American people, you know, whether it be media outlets lying about something or not going as deep into something they should or government deliberately covering something up from time to time. You know, like the New York Times, of course, covered up the Holodomor, but then again, that was, of course, nearly a century ago now. But once again, a lot of these institutions have earned a certain amount of mistrust, and that's why people go to these alternative sources thinking, well, I know the government and the media are lying to me, so maybe I should go to these other people who don't have the same power. They're, they don't have the same incentive to lie, I think. Little do they know that you can make money off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very dangerous power, but it's no there. Would, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's Abraham Lincoln who said that uh, nobody lies on the internet. Do you really think they would do that? Go on the internet and tell lies? I remember that speech. He made it right before the vampire invasion, where he had to axe up and get ready to defend us from blood-sucking vampires. I remember that. 18... 59, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. I, I read that book, yes. <laughs> but, like, um, I mean, there's there has always been this kind of undercurrent of, uh, like, you know, we talked about the John Birch Society, well, mentioned the John Birch Society a little bit. And for those who don't know what the John Birch Society is, should probably for my screen myself. Um, for those who don't know what the John Birch Society is, it is basically... Uh, the the whack job red baiters of the uh, of the McCarthy era. The um, in fact, there's a great song by the Mitchell Trio worth checking out called the John Birch Society, um, and it's it, the uh, that um, standard like um, anything slightly progressive is trying to subvert America. I, like this this document that we've been talking about does seem 
to be written by a bunch of birchers. Um, that I mean, they're they're red baiting throughout here, like through and through. Um, and like you know, the John Birch Society was formed in what, like fifty two. Um, you know, they've been around for like seventy years. Um, the uh, the um, and it's not like that they were while well, they were you know laughed at and made fun of. There's a reason why, like groups like the Mitchell Trio were making fun of them. They were well enough known that they could be made fun of. So that represents a significant undercurrent. And it's not like red baiting wasn't built into uh, into the Cold War rhetoric and all that kind of stuff. And then when you have you know hippies and the counterculture and all that kind of co- stuff coming up, then you have a significant uh, movement against it, which the movement against um, you know the new left and all that is called neoconservatism. Um, I mean, I've seen people who argue that Nixon was the first neoconservative president. Um, and that, uh, I mean, everybody agrees that Reagan was a neoconservative. Um, but there's also an economic ideology that feeds all of this as well. Um, that came up during stagflation and all, all that um, stuff during the 70s, the energy crisis and what uh, Jimmy Carter called the uh, the crisis of confidence. And what happened there is that people turned from from New Deal principles of um, of that uh, there needs to be a highly regulated economy that um, that uh, you know capitalism will inherently try to subvert the system and benefit itself that kind of thing and that um, turning away from that to the individual is the sole. Uh, is the sole arbiter of value and um, that we need to remove regulations. We need to remove welfare. We need to remove anything that the government is doing in order to uh, facilitate that market appeal. And that's called neoliberalism. Now, there's great debate as to when neoliberalism really took over in the U.S., normally centering sometime in during the Carter administration. But for sure, yet again, Ronald Reagan was was a uh, was a uh, neoliberal, so both neoconservatism in terms of culture and neoliberalism in terms of economics come in, and we see this these two things over and over and over again in the. Uh, did I freeze or something? No, you're good. No, you're good. Oh, but we it it um, undid the full screen for some reason. Um, but we see these two things over and over and over again in, in this 1776 thing. I was actually kind of astounded how much they tried to focus on group rights versus individuals, which is like neoliberalism as heck. Um, and and then, um, you know, all the rhetoric about how all oh, these hippies are making you know, are trying to ruin the founding fathers, which is neoconservatism as heck. That's why that's why I say it's like basically Reagan writing in the 90s after he'd been diagnosed with the Alzheimer's. You know? That's why they didn't have citations, because that's what hippie college students do. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, like, how do you write a, a histor- uh, historical diatribe like this and not have any citation? I had to actually, like, during the live stream, I had to do multiple times, like, searching for the quote, and then it's like, oh, it's part of this book. Okay, well, that's pro- a problem because you're quoting it out of context. So let's read the sentence right before that. Um, did, they, did they think that they were going to reach uh, liberals and, and, and the left by not going with the footnote of the end note, a la like how Howard Zinn did in the People's History of the United States? Is that what they were trying to go for? Do you think they were just like, well, he didn't do it and they love him. So why don't we do it and see if they just, you know, attach, uh, attach themselves to our document because we're doing it just like Zinn did. It's yeah, specifically brought up Zen. The, the, it did bring up Zen? Yeah. Oh, uh, it must have been one of the uh, appendices. Yeah, it, towards the end, yeah. Um, the, uh, but, um, the, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm losing my uh, train of thought. Uh, getting distracted by comments, and uh, thank you, all the uh, super chats. Um, 
<laughs> answer the Gonzo. question. Right, the what is your favorite Muppet character? Yeah, right. I'd go with Gonzo. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I was going to say the uh, the freaking Cookie Monster, uh, but <laughs> um, Adam. Wait, um, anyways, the uh, wait, that's Sesame Street. There's yeah. still Muppet. Yeah, I mean, same production oh, company. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, whatever. <laughs> The extreme distraction. Um, <laughs> we were talking about uh, like how this document uh, reveals like the neoliberal and neoconservative uh, things, and like how mm. citation is functioning there. The difference with uh, Howard Zinn, though, is that Howard Zinn was writing a textbook. Like he wrote plenty of other history other than a people's history of right. the United States, and like he he was a historian, so he did his due diligence but you don't include footnotes in a in a textbook like a text like textbooks are just generally crappy no matter what uh but like this is clearly a pamphlet to try to get teachers to start teaching their way how do you do that without citation you don't you don't like i mean if i'm a teacher and i'm looking over materials and i know Matt can attest to this as well, and Cypher for you as well, and, and and Heimler, you too. If I'm looking over materials to put together a lesson plan, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to know, well, where is this material coming from? Uh, is it primary or secondary? Who wrote it? What's the context of it? Why does it exist? And why is it important to have in, in my classroom for this particular lesson or this particular unit that I'm trying to teach? If I have none of that, why am I introducing something that is unfounded, not researched, shoddily written? Why am I introducing that to my students other than here's how you don't do history? Well, and also, let's be honest, like teachers don't have a whole lot of time. And so uh, when I first came across the PragerU video, I think it was like 2014 or something like that, maybe oh, no. before that. And when I first, you know, glanced, I was just trying to find a nice little video about the Civil War. And... You know, it, it, the video itself actually wasn't that bad. It was, uh, you know, I could tell it was a little was biased. Their, uh, was it their causes one? Pro I, probably, if yeah, I remember that, correctly. I've, that it's actually one, decent. Yeah, it, it's actually like one of the few ones that they got, like, they don't fill it with propaganda. Yeah, um, yeah. So the, Prager U actually can sometimes do that. Like, they can actually have good history mixed in with bad history. But um, my point being is that, you know, uh, again, teachers don't have enough time to vet everything. And so we put a lot of faith into curriculum materials a lot of times, even though we know we, we can potentially have access to anything we want. Um, and so I feel like I, just glancing uh, on like a site like Edpuzzle, which is a, a site that incorporates YouTube videos. Right. Uh, and it turns out you can uh, add assessments to it for your students. And I use that site quite a bit. I've seen several teachers and, you know, I'm talking like, AP teachers that use PragerU videos in their lessons. And I'm, uh, I, I wonder if, is it really ideology or is it, are they really just not, the, the teachers aren't, you know, practicing it's, media literacy and not critically so, analyzing, you know? So you're saying it's like a lot of this kind of rabbit hole is due to laziness. Well, yeah. I mean, not necessarily laziness because I've never met a lazy teacher in my life, but just, you know, practicality, to, like lack of time, you know? <laughs> You, <laughs> over, you oversaturate with like misinformation and mistakes. They won't have time to correct at all. Cause like any video that disproves a prayer you video has to be like five times longer than the actual prayer you video by necessity. Yeah. yeah. Well, not with that. I mean, also, like, if they want to save some time, just use brain pop. Brain pop is much better. Brain pop. Except the robot's secretly a communist, but other than that, <laughs> like I said, it's, it's much better. <laughs> But I mean, like, like even guys like like Heimler, I'd love to hear from you, man, because you've been teaching for a while, too. So like in terms of just prep, just because we there's not enough hours in the day. And I've only been this is my first year as a teacher. And I learned very quickly. There are not enough hours in the day for you to retain your sanity and to also prep those lessons. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely true. And, you know, I, I probably burned myself out. Um you know, too soon because my own, my personality, I, I don't, I don't want to use things that I didn't vet or create, or like, I don't know why that's, it's probably a character flaw. I don't know. But, um, 
so, but that I can attest to the fact that after, you know, nine years, I'm very tired. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not, I'm not presenting that as a virtue, um, because it's just more personality. Um, but yeah, so I, I yeah, if somebody gave me that, do the 1776 document and said, Hey, this is what you're going to implement. I'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Um, I, I didn't make that up. <laughs> so. Um, and like, while we're talking about, um, how teaching curricula, uh, curricula, curricula, curriculum, is, curriculum is, that, is, is curriculum the plural of curriculum? Curricula. Yeah, it's curricula, I think. I, th I think it is curriculum. Oh, I thought it was curriculum. Uh, if only there was a way for us to find out so quickly. Yeah, it is. It is curricula. Curriculies. Uh, <laughs> so with uh, with all of that, um, you know, is a lot of people have already been bringing up in the comments the uh, the 1619 project, which is an actual curriculum. This obviously is like the first pamphlet thing, but like the same thing went with the uh, with the 1619 project that it started off with a pamphlet, and that pamphlet got torn apart immediately. Um, and but like, I mean, people seem to be trying to equivalent the two, hmm. and I I want to uh, like let me put this. Uh, full screen so you get the point these are not the same <laughs> in no way is the 1619 project of the same level of, of bad as the 1776 in no way in no uncertain terms the 1619 project is absolutely better in every possible measure so just putting that out there, I, I want to make that very, very clear. Like, while we have, uh, in the previous stream, you can go back, and we had a great deal of criticism of the 1619 Project. Uh, the point being, this is not at all on the same level. <laughs> I actually Remember? saw this earlier in the comments of the live stream, but one person aptly put, uh, I'm sorry, it's probably too far gone for me to scroll up to see who said it, but... They put that at least the 1619 project was trying to make an argument while this thing is more of just like eliminating other arguments to begin with, yeah. which seems to be a very different lens that each of the two projects are taking. Yeah, you, also, you know, the uh, 1619 project seemed to be specific, like the one thing that they were attacking, like that they were clearly attacking was, you know, the lost cause, which, you know, good. Uh, but <laughs> like um, the... Uh, but they had an idea. Uh, they basically had an ideological enemy, but they were. It was a positive e argument, as in, like it was making a point. Um, this seems to be pl purely uh, negative, re reductionary. I don't know though. It, it's been a long time since I took modal. Reductionist one. sounds right because they're reducing the parts of history we're supposed to look at, so to speak. Yeah, so well, yeah, like should... they're all, they are also fundamentally making a different uh, uh, argument. And we should probably uh, somebody asked what the sixteen nineteen project was, so maybe we want to quickly review what that was. Does anyone want to tackle it? Or you... sounds like you should, man. Okay, fine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> essentially, New York Times. Um, and New York Times Magazine, I just pulled it up here just to make sure I got the dates right here. Um, it was This was in August 2019. They're looking at the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans in the Virginia colony, which was in 1619. That's why they called it that. And basically, um, I view it more of as a kind of activist uh, history approach where they're trying to reframe American history in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the legacy of slavery, essentially. I know that's oversimplification, but um, historians did cr criticize it. It wasn't like it was like... Uh, I'll point out this comment right here. <laughs> of course they're different. The difference is like 167. <laughs> uh, okay. 1776, 
69. Oh, gosh. That's a wonderful dad <laughs> joke. I love that joke. None of us are math teachers. <laughs> None. <laughs> I am tired of this bias towards reading, writing, arithmetic. We need to have more. Uh, science fetishization is definitely a thing, but uh, go ahead, uh, Matt. I mean, that was ba that was basically it. I didn't want to. Well, I, one of the key things about the 1619 Project is that it is a uh, reaction to the lost cause. It is trying to, uh, to um, you know, say like, Slavery is uh, inherently part of American history and should not be, uh, should not be, uh, you know, apologized for. Um, and but you know the problem is the the amount the the emphasis on slavery is so heavy-handed that they end up going overboard and saying like that the revolution was to uh, to to uphold slavery, which is just bonkers wrong but that that's not the same level here where it's like every other sentence is wrong also i'm pretty sure the 1619 project uh wants or at no point ever dissuades you from going to college or university unlike the 1776 project where on page 18 quote universities are hotbeds of anti-americanism oh my god yes so uh you know if, if you want to go to university or college, maybe the 1619 thing is your jam. If you're not for higher education because you're gonna be indoctrinated with anti-Americanism and you know all sorts of other uh, things that might infiltrate your little world, eh, 1776 might be more your speed. Don't tell them that some of the founding fathers went to universities, they might have an existential crisis on their oh, hands. Oh my God. Well, no, but see, those founding fathers went to school and there couldn't be anti-Americanism because there was no America. Oh, of oh, course, of oh. course. Well, I mean, I, part of that whole section is is saying that, like, you know, they actually do say that, like, the founders went to college and then deeply appreciated the college. And and at one point they were like, and, and uh, saying that the founders really wanted public public education, which is like, uh, that's like half a century later. Uh. I mean, what Benjamin are, Franklin are, kind of in Pennsylvania. Uh, public school here in New Mexico didn't become a uh, didn't become a thing until the twentieth century. Yeah, uh, New and, Mexico wasn't a state until the twentieth century. Sure, but like a lot of territories have uh, have public education systems during their territory. I mean, Puerto Rico has public education. <laughs> I mean, um, wait, time is a, time is a flat circle. Ka is a wheel. You know, just like, you know, apply whatever thing you want to add to it. Cows are a uh, spheroid. Um, but like the uh, <laughs> um, that's actually like a mathematics thing. Uh, but like the uh, the um, uh, like the fact that they couldn't even like figure out what the founders were dealing with in terms of education when they're referring to a system that comes about like in most of the eastern states like the north starts implementing public education in like the 1820s and 1830s the south really doesn't get it until after the civil war um and public education has a tremendous amount of change from its initial implementation to what it is today where it's very much the prussian model of of uh, public education, but like schoolhouses and that kind of stuff, that starts in the 1820s. Like, none of the founders believed in it because it didn't exist. Um, and so, like, when they're talking about this, like, oh, the founders wouldn't like believe in the thing. It's like, no duh. <laughs> they, they didn't even didn't, know about they it. They didn't have the intellectual capacity to predict the future like that. They wouldn't believe in airplanes either, but. Yeah, but it's one of those things where it's just like, you know, it's this idea that like society hasn't changed, that somehow we are, uh, that, um, you know, people are fundamentally the same at any time and any place so long, you know, there's that underlying human nature. Human nature never changes, right? Um, and that they believe that like they believe that idea so heavily that they're willing to take obvious social institutions that have been constructed 
and think that they are eternal. It's, it's the same thing with they keep on referring to the nation and believing in the nation. It's like, how many of the founders ended up moving back to England? Like, two of them who signed the Declaration of Independence. I know that. Um, Thomas Paine did. Uh, like, you know, people who had literally committed treason against England ended up moving back there because the idea of nationalism did not exist. I mean, I was, I was thinking about just, I mean, if you want to take it from 1619 V1776, there are two books that exist. I don't know if you guys, I, I assume you guys are familiar with them. There's one um, that's written by Gordon Wood, Radicalization of the American Revolution. And then you've got another book called Revolutionary Founders. Um, which is sort of like a, a, a collection of essays written by historians that was put together by guys like um, uh, uh, Gary Nash and uh, Ray Raphael. Um, um, Gary Nash is actually uh, at the center of, uh, of uh, the previous time. This was like a major crisis in terms of education. The, oh, uh, really? na the national standard. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, but the, nat uh, the national no, standard was a 90s thing and he was the leader of the uh, committee. Huh. They didn't, they didn't teach that in grad school. <laughs> didn't get that fact about good old Gary Nash. A, uh, great book on that is Pass Imperfect. I can't remember the name of the author. That's right. But Pass Imperfect, I will look that up. But in terms of just like thinking of like these two uh, projects, 1619 versus 1776, I mean, like I, I, my mind's just sort of drifted to those two books specifically. Um, because they tend to talk a lot about in the 1776 project, they tend to talk a lot about this idea of republicanism and how, you know, we are founded as a republic and so on and so forth. And this 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 pushing of uh, the American Revolution and then the documents of the Declaration and the Constitution. Gordon Wood in the in the radicalism of the American Revolution basically says his whole, his main thesis is that um, were it not for the American Revolution itself, no other movements would have been able to exist. It's kind of the, I'm not saying that it's a blanket set because the book is actually really good. It's really well researched. It, it, if you haven't read it, check it out. Um, but the overall argument is that were it not for the revolution, um, all of these other um, quote unquote marginalized groups, women, people of color, Native Americans, Black Americans, so on and so forth, um, they don't get to have their movements without the revolution. Whereas in the other book, which is Revolutionary Founders, you have this group of essays that focus specifically on individual figures, people like, oh man, like, uh, like, uh, like a, like a, like a shoemaker named Ebenezer McIntosh. And then you have also big names in there like Thomas Paine and so on and so forth. And that book tends to focus on the more marginalized individuals and communities and explains how it's because of their efforts, regardless of how big or how small, that led to movements happening within these marginalized groups. And just reading the 1776 project and how they just literally just gloss over hundreds of years of history to get like their point across. It made me think of this whole idea of Again, what type of history do you ultimately like? What type of history do you really want to learn? Do, do you want that heroic, um, 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 disnified version of history, or do you want to get into the? If you do, you want to get into the weeds. You know, do you want to get into the muck, and do you really want to like dig up and and learn about uh, specific figures and specific time periods to 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 show, you know, what what our history really is and what it could really be all about. Um, yeah, so, uh, the, uh, you know, that really digs into, uh, uh, one of the, uh, other questions that we have, uh, you know, that, you know, what is the purpose of school, um, purpose of education, you know, um, as, uh, Mr. B put it, uh, the, <laughs> um, the, uh, because, I mean, a lot of this is talking about, like, uh, I mean, it comes right back to what we had talked about last time, the whole patriotic education thing. And here it's, it's like, kind of explicitly nationalist, not just patriotic, but there's a significant difference between patriotism and, uh, and nationalism. 
Um, and we don't need to get into the weeds about like trying to define those terms because uh, I'm sure like I'm not even looking at the comments right now, but I'll bet you they'll be blowing up in just a second about like arguing over what the differences are. Uh, but main thing is nationalism is explicitly exclusionary. Um, you know, a, a nation is defined by who is in and who is out. Uh, patriotism does not necessarily uh, mean exclusion, um, but nationalism absolutely does. Um, and so the, uh, this is fundamental to, uh, to the 1776 uh, idea is that like, we should be teaching nationalism and like, is that the purpose of education? Yeah, no, I, I saw some comments mentioning how, um, universities are, some actually do kind of foster this hate towards our country, you know, like this idea that a pr professors are anti-American. And I, I just kind of chuckle because like, you know, this is why, okay, think about, really think about this. Why would you want others to hate us? Like, cause you're part of the, the professors are Amer Americans too. You know, it's like, so that's actually counter to nationalism you know, like I, I think the the whole point of uh, college and well, all educate. Let's just yeah. To your question, the point of education should be um, a better society. Ultimately, let's just simplify it like that because we want uh, our standard of living to go up. We want uh, there there to be less violence, and we want there to us to live longer and to uh, um, pursue. Uh, happiness, you know, the ideals, oh, Declaration of Independence, here we go. Uh, so when we talk about achieving that, w uh, well, the more informed a society is, the more empathetic a society is, because empathy is the most important to me when, as I teach social studies, like teaching my students empathy, um, I think the better off we all are. So I think that's how I would put it. Yeah, I mean, that focuses on the the community, I would agree. On the individual level, um, education is for the, the the purpose of education will be for the expansion of a student's humanity, um, which goes to the empathy thing you were talking about. And in order to expand a person's humanity, you must acquaint them with truth, with and truth just being the the apprehension of the world as it really is. And as we all know, the world is actually very complicated. You can't look at it through one single narrow lens. So to me, that's what it's for. Um, it, you know, reminds me of um, George Orwell in 1984. It's like, you know, two plus two equals four. And we, we must acquaint our students with that truth because that's how the real world actually works. And it, it's a tyrant who wants us to believe that two plus two equals five. Um, and that's simply for the consolidation of power, um, which is purely a reduction of humanity. Did you know that the whole two plus two equals five thing is a direct reference to Soviet propaganda from 1929? I did not. Yep. That's so an actually, action. So well, well, go on, go on, tell me, tell me. So uh, in 1929, Stalin uh, began what he called the Cultural Revolution. Um, and uh, Mao was explicitly trying to copy this, by the way, when mm -hmm. he did his in China. But, uh, you know, it was about like how uh, two plus two, uh, two workers plus two workers equal uh, truly equals five workers because the joint the, the joining of labor is greater than the sum of its parts. Huh. Um, you know, that's what the propaganda poster is. I mean, it's a poster. You can find it on, uh, it, there's a great website called uh, 17 Moments in Soviet History. Um, and great archive for primary sources and just like brief snippets of history. Um, ran by, I think, uh, the University of Minnesota, if I'm correct. Um, but the, uh, but like, George Orwell was very much specifically referencing that. Hmm. Um, it's, also, it's also a really good Radiohead song. So. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, back to your back to your point, Heimler. Of I think incentives do matter. Like when we're, we we say why we want everyone educated, uh, w- what you said really just kind of struck with me. As far as like yeah, like a tyrant, obviously um, they want whatever uh, information is going to lead to them having more power or staying in power. Whereas um, I think most of us can agree that we all just want us to like live free, healthy lives. And so our incentives to educate, I think, do we know a teacher that's a tyrant, you know, like really think about this. Like, why would you teach other than for a better society? But well, you're shaking your head, but uh, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. nodding my head. <laughs> yeah, you're nodding. Who is a, who is a teacher that's a tyrant? Like, that I don't wants- really want to name people, well, but I can- <laughs> Describe uh, this person <laughs> in I great can, detail. I can think of uh, I can think of um, professors that I had at UNLV at uh, were fiercely conservative, to say the least. Uh, let's put it that way, um, and would literally mark you down for saying anything un-American. And uh, so those people do exist. <laughs> Not to mention the teachers who view themselves more as like authoritarian babysitters than actual teachers, especially for younger students, like almost like the the Pink Floyd teacher from like another brick in the wall, where if you like so much as say one thing out of line or you draw in your nose, then just like right on your around your wrist. What is elementary school other than than just like government ran babysitting? Nap time. (laughs) Nap time. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think teachers, I, I don't know of any teacher that's intentionally tyrannical, but but teaching a teaching in a manner that is uh, reductionistic, I don't know, I don't want to use the word tyrannical, I mean, but, but there is a sense of the reduction of humanity in that way, in, of, of the student. Like, I've got a, I've got you, Matt, you were talking about the homeschool stuff, like, I've got a homeschool uh, U.S. history textbook for high school age students where it literally says, I, I, if I had time, I'd pull it off. It literally says that God created capitalism, you know, like, <laughs> like, and, and, and the teachers are, are using this stuff. Like, is it tyranny? No, but it, it is certainly reductionistic think- and, and, and taking away, narrowing down the, the flourishing of the humanity of a student. Yeah, it, the tyranny, tyrannical is not the right word here because, like, they mean well. They really think that they're making the world a better place. They do. Mm-hmm. So, should so, we say maybe something like um, kind heartedly misguided? Yeah, I mean, like, there's also, uh, I've definitely seen, uh, I remember in high school, there was a teacher that, uh, that was rather tyrannical about, uh, you know, um, basically, uh, she said at one point that uh, you know there were no good pr- uh, there were no strong presidents between Jackson and Lincoln and I was like uh, Polk and <laughs> is it really she, strong? And we had one term. And, well, she said, "Well, I'm from Mexico and we don't like them there." And I'm like, "I'm from America." <laughs> like, I don't there's a, like the difference cool. between between being. <laughs> There's a difference between being tyrannical in the classroom, uh, because that's a, obviously a power struggle there, and right. versus like promoting tyranny uh, in the broader sense. That's what I'm talking about. Like, you're obviously you're going to have these power struggles within a, a classroom or within a school setting. But I think ultimately, like, you know, it's easier for all of us if, if we generally have a society that knows what they're doing. Like, if we, the the more skills everyone has the better all of us are that's literally in our dna that's like an evolutionary thing we're talking about now the last thing you want as a teacher is to have your students go out into the world having said well that was a waste of time mm-hmm. like you don't want that you know you you want to do your best as a teacher because again i think i can hopefully speak for matt and and, and heimler as well as like It's not about, for a history class at least, it's not about having your kids come to class because it's, oh, history story time. We as history teachers have a responsibility to prepare 
the, the students how to physically and literally interact in the world and to give them that skill set of, of not just like how to speak and how to write and how to read sources and so on, but how to be a part of a society, you know, how, how to have civic or civil discussions with people that fervently disagree with you. If, if you don't do that as a, as a, as a social studies teacher, as a history teacher, that I think is when you have failed to set your kids up for success. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I don't know what the, the true path is for a student, especially in high school, because, um, you know, I, I, I always, I always come back to complexity. I, I want my kids to learn the complexity of the world. And, you know, I'm talking about these, you know, the book on my shelf and it's like, I, I don't know. I don't know that those do as much harm as maybe we think. I don't know. I, this is theoretical. You guys can jump in. But because in order to like, it's not a bad thing to have a solid place to stand uh, ideologically, whether, even if it's not logically consistent and coherent. Um, it's it's helpful to have a, a solid place to stand if only um, so that you can stand somewhere else later. Um, like I used to, for my students, I did this for one year and it was a terrible failure, maybe because of me, but I, uh, in U S history for their textbook, I, I had them read Howard Zinn and Paul Johnson. Um, wow. what's the Paul Johnson book? I can't, uh, history of the American people. History of American people, right? Yeah. And, uh, I thought, I mean, I didn't make that idea up. That was, uh, Lendl, Calder. Uh, Calder, thank you. Um, and uh, you know who's except he, called the history of American people. What's that? You know who was uh, the first person to publish a uh, book called The History of the American People? Oh, oh gosh, gosh, I think I know where this is going already. God damn it. This going to be some <laughs> hard, horrid person. Who is it? Hitler? Who is it? About the same. Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, it's going to be Wilson. It's going to be Wilson. I already know this is coming. I just, had, that, I just had to throw it in there. Yeah. Okay. His, uh, his series, The History of the American People, okay, started being published in uh, 1904. We need uh, to anyway. make a variation of that, like uh, Goldstein's Law or whatever, that like Hitler is always brought up in conversation, but just make a new one, but it's Wilson and Cypher instead. <laughs> <laughs> like you talk with Will, you talk with Cypher long enough, Wilson will be brought up. Cypherian <laughs> law states. I mean, look at the chat right now. <laughs> <laughs> now take your shot. Now you've been waiting for it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, go ahead, uh, Steve. <laughs> well, I, I don't know that I have much else to say. Uh, only that um, I, I don't know that th this was their first real exposure to you know, a survey of American history and, and reading about it from such like radically different perspectives. I don't know that it was helpful to them. I, it might've confused them more than it helped them. Good. So, it, <laughs> Good. But that's, that, but that's what I'm wondering. Like, it, I mean, I know that's a great exercise for, for college students. I, 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 I don't know. There was a few people that it really was impactful for. Um, but I'm not. I'm not totally sure. I may, maybe just having one-sided ideological place to stand. God created capitalism. But that's and what parents do. That's literally what parent. You're a parent. That's what we do. Like, and I try not to do it. But like, when from a very young age, it's just easier as a parent just to give them like, okay, this is the way it is. That's the way it yeah. is. And then the complexity will. Ha I mean. I think the, a big reason why we have public schools is to force students to be uncomfortable, like to like, hey, there are other people with different beliefs, different values, different perspectives. Like, uh, I don't think you should. I think that's a great exercise. And yes, they should be confused. I'm sorry. I'm passionate about this. Like, keep confusing them. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. No, you take the screen off me. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in support of the whole teachers or tyrants thing, uh, Robert Mugabe was a teacher before becoming dictator of Zimbabwe. I mean, why do you think I became a teacher? 
I'm on the track. I set myself a track. You're really passionate about Zimbabwe. In 10 years, <laughs> I've set up my, I've got a vision board and everything. It's great. For like, it's like, I mean, so, but there's also a significant difference between, uh, like, um, between teaching at like the high school and middle school level and, and college where, um, you know, one in, in high school, you have like so much more time uh, than I do. Um, you know, I get two sessions a week. Each session is like an hour and 15 minutes, I think. Um, That's over all the you course get for of, teaching college classes? Over the course of 15 weeks. Wow. Yeah. So you have to, you have to get, uh, you have to have those uh, lectures nailed down good. Uh, but like the, uh, and man, YouTube has helped. <laughs> uh, but it it also means that uh, you can't really be too dictatorial. Um, like the format itself bars you from being dictatorial. I mean, you can, um, but like not so easily because you can't sit there and lord over them. Like this is the way to think. Um, you know, you're constantly having to sit there and say like. And there's other ways of think. There's other things, but we're moving on. <laughs> like you're constantly having to undercut your own lecture because of the uh, because of how limited of time you have. Um, now, mind you, uh, I, like we split up um, American history so that like I, I'm teaching the second half right now. So it starts at 18 at the end of Reconstruction and goes to present, and before that it goes from beginning to um, 1877. Um, so, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it might come out to being, you know, only a little less, but it's still less time. Um, but at the same I, time, I, I, would, I would force students to do a bunch of homework. I would push back on that and say that high school, middle school, we might, yes, we might meet with our kids every single day. And we have... Yeah, like 10 months, nine, 10 months out of the year to, to, to play with. But you're also not considering the idea of days that you have to dedicate of throwing out your lesson to reteach what needed to be taught. Because based on a quiz or an exam or a formative assessment that you gave your kids, they didn't score high enough or do well enough for you to comfortably move on with the lesson. So there are plenty of times in our schedule where we have to... Yeah, that's a good are, point. I, yeah. I, that's, I, I do want to say that, like in in college, you know, if they don't get the lesson, that's their fault. Right, right. <laughs> you're paying. Like, to, right, you're paying to go to that university. So if you don't get it, that's that's just your loss on your money. Yeah, that's that's not a return on your investment. But in high school, because if, especially like in the public school setting, there are like days where we have to literally stop the lesson and go, okay, let's go over this part again. And you'll literally take them back to the beginning of the week. At a point where you have to be like, okay, at this point, we should move on to this lesson. There's always a calendar and there's always a lesson plan that you have in mind. And in an ideal utopia, uh, yes, everything would follow that, that calendar and that schedule. Yeah, and you would get it. Hard. <laughs> right, exactly. But you're going to have a lot of students that are coming from a lot of different diverse backgrounds. And a lot of students don't get the lessons as fast, can't perform as well academically, have questions, have problems understanding the language that you're speaking because they come from another country and they just showed up about two weeks ago. And you've got to try to keep them on pace. So with high schoolers, with high school uh, lessons, middle school lessons, um, yeah, we have a whole year with, with our kids. But the pacing of that is always going to be dependent on um, what exactly it is that they're getting and you making sure that they're able to fully comprehend and understand that lesson so that you can comfortably move on. I hope it's not my internet connection because I'm hosting this. So I, I hope I'm, you guys aren't getting a like badly digitized sound, but I, I got most of what you were saying. It's just, uh, I'm hoping maybe somebody in the comments can tell us if if that was getting all digitized um i think it might be comcast doing their thing ah, um, Comcast. yeah i've been uh i had them drop twice during a lesson twice in a zoom call with my students that was that was embarrassing um but uh yeah like 
the the structure of of uh, high school is also a lot more rigid, and that like I when I was told to make le uh, like a uh, well don't really have lesson plans. It's like when I was told to write lectures for uh, for um, my classes, I was literally just like, here's a bunch of books, have at it, like. I've never taught a class before, but go. <laughs> and like, I mean, I, I had I had support. Like I could go and, and ask people stuff. But like the implication was that like I should be able to do this on my own. Um, and I shouldn't have to rely on other people's syllabi in that. Like I have total free reign to make my lectures about anything, right? Um, and that's just not possible in high school. You have to deal with like state authority and that kind of stuff. But also, you have to deal with these kinds of uh, inputs from the state, where it's like, well, have you read the 1776 report? Um, you know, like these things are going to uh, these things actually put into uh, the system. So how does that? How do reports like this um, apply to this like theory of what education is? Hard questions, yeah. <laughs> and I feel like I'm back in actual classes again where the professor asks a question and everyone's just dead silent. Yeah. Well, it's always useful in a seminar when I ask a question like that and I freaking can just stare at people. Oh, hi, King. Um, but if this, uh, if this is true remote learning, uh, Heimler, myself, Mr. Beat, Grant, and Tiger, uh, everyone should turn their cameras off and mute their microphones. <laughs> And not answer for the duration of this uh, of this uh, lecture. Yes. Oh no, my my class is right in the syllabi. We're like, no, you are not allowed to turn the camera or the microphone off. You're not getting away with that. I just tell my students, it's like, you know, you can attend class if you want. Um, like I record the things and I you know post them so that they can see it. Um, but like, you will fail if you don't. Like pure and simple, you will fail, and I have no problem failing you. <laughs> The choice to fail is yours. <laughs> See, that's yeah, the difference like, between I high was, school and college. I was, also, right. I was also told specifically that, like, as long as I have one A, a singular A, whatever I gr uh, give to everyone else, it's okay. You don't give them anything. They all earn it, right? That's what we say as teachers. Like, uh, I guess. the... <laughs> yeah, not not if uh... you are a tyrant. I knew. It. <laughs> I I give awards. Well, you gotta give you gotta give that one kid an A, and then you can let everybody else earn whatever they get. That does seem like the opposite of high school, because in college, okay, you only need one A, and then you're fine. But in high school, you only had one A. Do you want yes. us to shut the school down? Yes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> And that's kind of getting to the root of a lot of the problems with school is that it's so much of it is just like arbitrary um, hoops that students have to jump through just to prove that they can accomplish something. I, I even tell my students, it's like, hey, literally, it doesn't matter if you really learn all this stuff or not. It's just mostly like we're mostly just seeing if you have discipline, self-discipline so we can so you can make it out there beyond high school. But I mean, like you think about how much a lot of students have suffered this past year with the pandemic with remote learning that actually yeah. is related to what we were talking about because like i mean so many students and i even saw in the chest like you don't need to go to college we have the internet bull crap like to, what when my opinion like just all my years with, with you know studying pedagogy and, and practicing pred like teaching in the classroom it's the interaction with other human beings that is the the key to success for most um, students. It's the the fact the that we're social, yes, we're social creatures at, at the core, and it takes a certain type of student to be successful, highly disciplined, highly motivated, who can actually make it with remote learning. And in college, even so many students struggle. Like if they're just doing it online only, like that's not easy for most so, college well, students. We are getting a little bit into the weeds and also say hello to King. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, uh, um, but uh, to return it to back to the question, how does this, you know, we're talking basically the theory of education. What does reports like the 1776 uh, report indicate? What does the, how does that apply um, when we have this particular theory of education? 
I will stare until somebody answers. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, were they attempting to, was this, had it rolled out, had it been implemented, would it have been um, like a, a curriculum, um, a requirement? Is this a, a suggestion? What, what was the intention? I don't know. It, it was eventually to make a curriculum out of this. They, they, as uh, the same thing happened with 1619. They they put out like an initial statement about what they were going to do, um, at basically a pamphlet, um, and then built a curriculum from there. Um, well, in order and, to make this a curriculum, the first thing you need to do is have people that know what they're talking about write <laughs> this thing. That would help. <laughs> Just saying. But, but yeah, I mean, for for me, it's like if if I'm mandated by the state and my job is at stake to teach that stuff, I'll I'll teach it. But I'll I mean I'll I'll tell them what it says. But you know, I'm I'm certainly in no way going to leave it there. Um, in fact, I think it would be like I almost like bring let, let's do this. I kind of want I want that challenge. Let's let, bring that to me. Let make me teach that. Put my <laughs> job on the line. And let me see. Let me see how I can undermine it. I mean, that's that's something that, like, you know, um, because uh, state mandated um, curricula. I, I think it is curricula, um, but yes. that state mandated curricula is necessarily against the theory of education. And we we talked about this a little bit last time, where we were talking about the. Uh, the ability of the educator to uh, like to pick and choose their curriculums, curricula, uh, you know, like to to pick bits and pieces, like you know how like uh, the Howard Zinn Institute is still like a powerful force within, uh, within, um, you know, uh, pulling sources and and you know teaching uh, stuff. I'm not I'm not a a, a grade school teacher, so I can't say to that uh i certainly don't use anything from the uh from that i use uh american yop for most of my stuff and wikipedia actually um wiki uh, wiki source is awesome um but the uh um you know that is kind of what the 1776 thing is fighting against right is this is this influence from things like howard zinn and the 1619 project and all that kind of stuff um it is very old kind of culture wars stuff that where it's, you know, how dare they be teaching how it's in. Well, but um, also, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but just like, it's also really at its core, it's they, it's a reaction to perce the perception that this, this, uh, we're, that students are being taught to hate their own country. Yeah. And Ooh, I just don't. That's see, a good question right there too. I say the people that love, I think patriotism with education, I think, uh, uh, you gotta have a part of that be criticism. Like, think about our own loved ones. You know, like who do we criticize more than anyone? The people that we love, the relation, our relationships. Like, I think that if you love your country, then you're going to look at it for what it really is, and to just ignore the blemishes and just gloss over the, all the bad stuff. That's unpatriotic, and so it's so even it's like perception of. You know, it gets it wrong from the very beginning that that you know students are being taught to hate their country. It's just absurd at its core. I know maybe Grant disagrees with me on this because I I know we talked about that before, but I just don't see how they can just jump to that conclusion. Well, so uh, uh hold on uh, to to bring it up to uh the, so we have talked a little bit about the theory of education, and mostly it's been this kind of humanistic uh. Most of us have said something about like it, you know, it's to better society, it's to better ourselves, kind of thing. Um, you know, it, and honestly, that seems just kind of like bog standard um, in terms of like the, it shouldn't even be controversial, but it is obviously. But like the, uh, but this gets into, uh, you know, we we are bringing up the idea of un-American um, and. This report reveals a lot about what the far right, uh, I mean, 
mostly far right, uh, thinks of what uh, you know Americanism is, and and that criticizing that in any way is uh, is inherently un-American, right? Um, that, uh, it, but that seems to be purposefully um, uh, obfuscation, uh, obfuscatory. Is that a word? <laughs> um, obfuscating what is core to that ideal of uh, un-Americanism, and that un-Americanism falls right back to nationalism, falls right back to what we talked about, patriotism. We seem to not be saying that, like, uh, you know, school is to teach patriotism, um, but that patriotism necessarily uh, requires criticism and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so what is this un-Americanism? And I, I'm guessing Grant really wants to say something here because uh, he's definitely talked about it. What What is this un-Americanism? And, like, does it reveal something about the report? Does it reveal something about uh, colleges in general? Is it, you know, a longer movement? All that kind of stuff. Okay, well, <clears throat> I guess if you want to get an idea of what un Americanism is, it's, I guess it's this idea that, I'm, I'm sorry, hold on. I got some distractions in the back. Let me take care of that for a moment. So, someone else keep this talk, conversation going. I got to take care of something in the back. Oh, okay. So, uh, um, anybody want to answer that? What is un-Americanism? Mm -hmm. I believe it's a noun. <laughs> <laughs> you with the uh, one liner tonight. Technically, it's an adjective, so you're wrong. You're is it though? But, but it's the ism, not un-American. Un-American uh, would be the adjective. Right. Un-Americanism yeah. would be the noun. Damn it. Parts <laughs> of speech. Math Parts and English. Speech. <laughs> now we have to get uh, out that so, freaking uh, whiteboard uh, where you put like you know, subject, verb, oh. and draw the lines underneath each part. Right. Going going full circle back to the original conversation of this stream, we were having, like, what, a two-hour debate at, like, 3 a.m. on whether it was insurrectionist or insurrectionary? Do you remember yeah. that? Uh, well, uh, we weren't debating about whether or not it was insurrectionist or insurrectionary. That's just, like, silly... Um, you know, etymology stuff, but like the, I distinctly uh, remember us arguing this for two hours at three in the morning and you were drunk and I was really tired <laughs> and we were just, Oh, oh you're talking about last night. <laughs> oh no, it was like the night before, but you're like, this article says insurrectionary. I thought it was insurrectionist. <laughs> no, 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 no. It is insurrectionist. Insurrectionary is not a word. Yeah, it is. And then we just yeah. went at it for like an but, hour. But the, the beginning of this conversation was about like, uh, you know, what to label it all, uh, overall. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it was related to the Capitol Hill thing. That's but, the conversation you're having. Yeah. I mean, oh, there's all kinds of funny stuff that happens in drunk chats and uh, on the Discord server. Man, it's awesome. fun. Yo, Join our Discord eloquent. servers. Yeah, Yo, a, you got some a, eloquent. A link to mine, and in mine there is a link to a bunch of other people's there. You uh, but like, eloquent <laughs> I'm uh, you need to get a you need to get a Discord. You have yeah, one? Discord is great. Um, but anyways, you. Uh, me? To, I got one, yeah. baby. I got one oh. last week. Okay, okay. I'm, on, I'm on it right now. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, um, but we were talking about un-Americanism, and it does relate to that. Like, how, like, I think we can pretty easily label what happened at the Capitol un-American. But it's the same administration that put this report out that's labeling a bunch of, you know, like, progressives are un-American and stuff like that. Uh that um, it's literally that same administration that supported the insurrection. And that is American if I've ever heard it. Yeah, and so what is this? Like, is it just revealing, you know, that like un-American is just a word you throw out there because you, uh, because you don't like somebody or is there something more to it? Uh, I see that Grant is back, so uh, you want to weigh in? Yeah. So okay. So there's a. So un-American has been used in numerous ways. It's it's used in a it, un-American is used by the right in a lot of the same ways that the left uses like Nazi or fascist. And that 99% of the time, it's mostly used to just silence a dissenting opinion. And 
But when someone on the right is thinking what is anti-American, I think it's more along the lines of like everything they talk about is, oh, America is the bad guy in this. Like, oh, in the war on terror, America is the real bad guy. Or, oh, when it comes to the horrors of capitalism or whatever, America is the real bad guy here. The Cold War, America was the real bad guy because we did X thing, just ignore the Soviet Union was an actual literal dictatorship for the entire thing. I think, I think that's sort of the idea is, is, is this constant portrayal, at least from conservatives' perspective of America is constantly being portrayed as the bad guy. And if America is being portrayed as the bad guy, then you, someone who identifies with America and, or being American is a big part of your personal identity, then you are the bad guy. And I think that is sort of the initial sort of the, the mindset that's going on when they're throwing around the term un-American. So I'm not the bad guy is what they're trying to say. That's, I think, I think that's a great way of phrasing it. Cause I think that's, that's like the, uh, I mean, there is absolutely the, 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 cause I mean like the same thing happens on the left where, you know, you just throw out fascist because like, you know, that, you know, bad guy fascist, but there is also that like kind of deep, like discourse about like what fascism actually is. Um, and I think that's what we should have here. And I think you hit the nail on the head that it's uh, that it's it is related to that idea of uh, demonization versus uh, triumphalism. That, but like, there seems to be a very clear line being drawn in this report. And remember, the people who stormed the Capitol um, were literally, you know, chanting "USA, USA," and you know proclaim themselves as patriots and stuff like that. I, I mean, I have n never ending disgust for somebody who's willing to proclaim themselves as a patriot and do something like that. And be a traitor. Yeah. I think but they that... all really saw themselves as revolutionaries, like in the American revolution, saying like the fact that tons of them were filming themselves as they were committing crimes <laughs> clearly showed that they, for one, they thought they were going to win. At least a bunch of them thought they were going to win. And that they would be seen as heroes. Because then in their mindset, they're sort of role-playing this idea of, you know, we are the new revolutionaries. We will refound the true American republic based on our interpretation of values that we vaguely get from Enlightenment language and the Declaration of Independence. Although, and also, I think King really wants to say hi, because he's just like... <laughs> <laughs> he's that, staring that, until the answer. Look, look at that pose, man! What? That's a power. That's a power stance right there. Oh, he sits like this all the time. Where he'll just like be like, I'll be uh, my my computer's like over there, um, normally, and uh, like he'll, he'll sit here and then just go meow, meow, meow. I mean, I would I would argue that that cat is half gargoyle the way he's sitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's adorable, but uh, the uh, the. The thing on on um, the Capitol right, insurrection, uh, I like Capitol siege. That's a, that seems good. Uh, the uh, the Capitol siege is that like um, that the uh, um, you know they're proclaiming that they're trying to uh, to you know adhere to some uh, imagined great America from behind, from from uh, the past. Um, and, you know, while we're talking about un-American and everything, and also talking about how that's used to silence people, there's also that term fascist. And the storming of the Capitol did seem a great deal like, you know, 1923 19, uh, in, in Munich or 1922 in Rome. Um, and, like, how do we reconcile them proclaiming patriotism or ultra nationalism or anything along those lines uh with this 1776 report and just the general idea of it well it's, uh, i'm sorry go ahead matt sorry so well, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the, sorry a lot of the people involved in the beer hall push in 1923 in munich is that a lot of them thought they were restoring a true germany just mm -hmm. as a lot of these people at the uh capital storming riot whatever we're calling it now Thought Make America of, great again. Yep. They, this idea is we are restoring the true America. And I think that is sort of the connection here. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a restoration of an imagined past. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. It's, it's also, fun. 
Weren't there like some Confederates who proclaimed that they were just like the next Washington and that they were doing the second American revolution as well? So the seal of, uh, of the Confederacy was of Washington. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just so funny that like in this report, there's a line on page 16 in the report. It talks about how, uh, that this, that this 1776 project is all about like, you know, uh, teaching like the, 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 the true history where we're able to revere heroes and, you know, so on and so forth. And they say that those of us that are like reading this report and learning this, this kind of history must stand up to the quote, petty tyrants end quote, and quote, defend our way of life end quote. Yeah. And I found those lines very fascinating to read because that to me seemed very much like a call to action to say anybody that stands yeah anybody that stands against these particular beliefs is someone that needs to be like put in their place and yet this is the same people that also on page 19 there's a whole section of this report called reverence for the law and in <laughs> and a quote no one is above the law. Mm -hmm. And yet the funny thing is, is when they're talking about no one is above the law, the way it's written, go back and read it. I got the feeling of no one is above the law, especially if you are somebody that is out in the streets chanting for Black Lives Matter, if you are chanting for people of color, if you are chanting for uh, equity and, and, and equality and against systemic racism and so on and so forth. Back the blue, yada, yada, yada. And, then they're, feeling, and then they're literally smacking police. with. I have, I'm saying, I have a feeling that this was written and ready to go way before the, what happened at the Capitol happened because there were no edits to this. Like it came out the way it is. It's very also, much, it's very I much. A back think, uh, thank you, Himmelganger. I will de definitely give him uh treats for actually not being such an annoying cat most of the time <laughs> but, this, but this this report to me is like it's, it's very much a back to blue report right and 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 you know no one is above the law especially if you're like protesting and, and you're like looting or blah, blah 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 but then what happens at the capitol becomes that contradictory statement and then it falls into the and then it falls into this discussion what then becomes un-american when your actions go against exactly what your side is trying to proclaim yeah, and also i want to point out they they repeatedly claim that everyone is equal before the law which uh have have you forgotten what happened last year uh but like and and especially what was really stark was you know the uh, the police uh were barely even manned when they when they ended up getting in the siege metro uh, dc metro barely showed up uh, Freaking Trump didn't want to send in troops to deal with the siege, um, even though the uh, troops had already started getting readied by uh, by Maryland and Virginia. Um, you know, all of this shows a very clear thing that no people are not equal before the law. But the way that they phrase it makes it that people are only equal before the law because we believe it. Yeah, it's. I I, I, oh. I need to find that specific section because it was like, are they literally arguing that because we believe in equality that we are equal? I believe if you're looking for that, that law section, it's page 19. Sounds like relativism to me. Uh, yeah, so yeah, here it is. It's literally the start of the first part of the thing. The principles of equality and consent mean that, uh, that all are equal before the law. The principles mean it. Notice that? No one is above the law, and no one is privileged to ignore the law, just as no one is outside the law in terms of its protection. It's, 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 I mean, dude, we're talking about un-Americanism, and we're talking about this idea of patriotism and nationalism and, and, and so on and so forth. I always tend to fall back on a quote from, Fe from Frederick Douglass, a man who they put in this report for out of context reasons, there's a picture of him on like page two or three. They, they just have is, him show up, and, and yeah. it's the same thing they have like with MLK. He just like shows up. Token. Yeah, yep. exactly. The artwork in this thing is like is a is a discussion into itself. But 
There's a quote from Frederick Douglass. They love putting Frederick Douglass in this thing because they want to say, no, we're not racist. Look, here's a black. Like, you know, they're, they're, so, but a black. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But here's the thing. Frederick Douglass himself has a great quote on patriotism, which I, I love. And the day I don't have to do remote learning anymore and I get like my own physical classroom, I want to blow this up on a banner and put it in the room. He says, quote, uh, when defining patriotism, he says he for he is the lover of his country who rebukes and does not excuse its sins. Be proud of where you're from. Love where you're from. But don't gloss over it and act as if it's the only perfect place on the planet. They do actually say in numerous par parts of this that um, that patriotism does not mean excusing the uh, thing. Like they they do at least put the words in there so that they can they can weasel out of saying that they are. Of course, every time I ran into that, I was like uh, underlining and going, "But you just did that." <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's that uh, it's the do what I say and not what I do kind right. of thing. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah. like, this is supposed to be the foundation of a curriculum, so it is exactly do as I do, do as I uh, do, do as I say. Know? Right. Um, yeah. My my whole impression of this thing, as I read it, just as a summary, was I mean, there's definitely some Francis Fukuyama vibes happening, but also it just felt like a. It felt like a, I was reading a John Trumbull painting, you know? Yeah. Like that's that, that's what this thing was to me. It was John Trumbull casting I, pros. I, I don't know who John Trumbull is. <laughs> John what? Trumbull, he, he's the, um, he, you, you know his paintings. Um, he painted the, the, the Declaration, just, signed the declaration just, of Independence. I'm on the freaking internet. I can just look it up. <laughs> yeah. You you you've sir, sir, Oh, okay. He's the one actually commissioned by the uh, by the uh, Congress to actually uh, to paint like the founding. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And like uh, you know, um, that's not what the signing of the Declaration was like. Um, no, those people weren't there all together in one room. It's, it's, it's yeah. romanticism, is what it is. So that that's that's the vibe I got from this. And unfortunately. If if this, I, I don't think I certainly don't think we've seen the last of this. Um, there's still plenty of people in the federal government in very high ranking positions who are favorable to this. Um, and so the 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 hope that I have is that it's not based in reality, and you can only go so long um, before you crash, you know, believing things that are not in line with reality before you crash against the rocks of reality and it wakes you up. So oh, it's going to be okay. <laughs> I, I mean, we've been talking about this idea of an Americanism, this idea of, and I've been trying to kind of lean towards this like bigger question about like neoliberalism and neoconservatism. And that's, uh, that's the, uh, the thing that I'm, like almost kind of hopeful for seeing a silver lining in all of this is that like we've been in the the throes of a hard turn to the right since like since nixon. stagflation yeah uh no i wouldn't say during nixon i would more say during carter uh, uh carter 70s was, was a all deregulator up. my friend <laughs> that's the point yeah he was oh, oh yeah so that's okay so we agree then yeah and um, i would so like and but I'm saying, Go like, ahead. I think maybe this might signify a, uh, you know, a reckoning, a time that we need to actually um, come to terms with all of this. I think that's kind of one of the things that I, I really hope to, that folks viewing this will get out of this conversation is that there are, while well, Trump is, you know, gone and, you know, we now have the Biden administration, I don't, uh, I, I, this is not over this is not done like well we might have seen the extreme of it um we have been in the throes of this for 40 years um and we've been just steadily heading further and further to the right um you know trump revealed uh or laid bare a lot of these divisions but Took they were already there took advantage of him yes yeah, I, I was actually i was just gonna say that yeah it's 
we had some comments earlier. Is this more economic or more of a culture war? And I think the more the I, difference. Uh, yeah, they are related exactly. Like, and I, I think, uh, or why not yes, both? The, yeah, why not both? But I think the, um, well, you know, as long as we see stuff like this, the 1776 commission, um, that this is not going to get better. This is just going to keep fueling the fire. And then look how worked up we're all getting. And we're mostly, I would say like, you know, some might in the chat in the comments call us, oh, look at these lefties. And I do not consider myself that at all. Um, and so like, I, but I, I do know that we value the truth so much that I think that's going to be the key to what you were, what you and Heimler were just saying, Cypher, with the um, I maybe we've reached a turning point where we're realizing uh, there are there's common ground that we got to get back to. And this commission is really just reactionary that literally con contradicts itself, that moves the field, the, the, the goalposts. And that if you actually read, like I said at the very beginning of this, like if you read parts of it, you're like, I was found myself nodding like, yeah, it's, but then it went on. And so I, I think that it's funny, too, because like Fox News will have they'll criticize somebody like Bernie Sanders. But when they cr criticize him, they accidentally make him look good. Sometimes this is always an interesting <laughs> phenomenon. And so then it, that's another thing that makes me hopeful that actually a lot of us do have more in common than we think. <laughs> we just we haven't been able to really articulate it very well because we just communication has gone so gotten so bad. That's really a big part of it. Especially in the world of the internet, it's surprising that we have that. And I think yeah. this is kind of a, uh, a we're, we're kind of hitting a much uh, a good point to just kind of wrap everything up. Um, so I want to I want to give everybody the ability to to um, you know make a final statement, and I'll I'll wrap it up after that. So let's just go around the same way we went around introducing ourselves, and just say how you uh, think like this what what should be the takeaway from this conversation uh let's start off with you steve <laughs> takeaway wow we, we covered so much ground um Feel i mean with <laughs> yeah no with respect to uh the 1776 document um i think the takeaway is it is a um it is a incredibly uh, one-sided document that is not based in reality um, whatsoever. There, there, there are, I, I agree with you. There, there are some true things in it. Um, yes. Um, but truth to the excuse, exclusion of a complex and full reality. So, um, so yeah, uh, I, I'll go back to what I said near the beginning, which is, I think the takeaway is what we're looking at is a not a historical inquiry um, or even an attempt at an historical inquiry, but um, but a political document um, that tells us way more about the political moment than it does about our uh, search for a usable past or even a true past. I'll move on to Sammy. I will say. If you're going to read the 1776 project and seriously consider it, I would challenge you then to read other sources that contradict what you're reading in 1776 and challenge yourself because again, history is not a one-sided affair. Never has been, never will be. So I would challenge you to read the 1619 Project, read essays from the 1619 Project. Or if you're someone that only read the 1619 Project, then read 1776. You know, have those clashing ideologies hit in front of you. Because that's one of the ways, one of the more important ways, I think, that you're going to be able to understand both sides of the argument. And you're able to come out with your own conclusion. Do I think that the 1776 project is something that needs to be taught in, in schools? No. Um, primarily because I look at that document and I see it as something that's just incredibly flawed. It's just bad writing. It's just bad history. But if again, just in general, if you're somebody that wants to look at this document, 
don't stop there. Challenge yourself and encourage yourself to read the other side, read other perspectives, read conflicting perspectives, because that's how you end up becoming a well-rounded uh, person when it comes to specific subjects and specific topics. Because being well-rounded means then you're able to make a much more informed decision about things. And being much more informed is ultimately the end game here. Being, being more informed, being able to suss out what is truth from, from, from untruth and coming to hopefully a rational understanding and rational conclusion about what it is you're reading about so that you can have conversations like the ones that the six of us have had tonight. And uh, ever? Um, the problem with going uh, near to last in one of these things is that everyone has already said basically what I wanted to say. Oh, did we just lose Heimer? Oh, oh we so did. did. Uh -oh. He said his piece and bounced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't really have much more to add. Just make sure that you, when you go through these sources, just have a an objective but a skeptical mind as well. It, like if something doesn't have citations, maybe it's not the best source. And like I, I, I don't know. I'm I'm honestly really hungry and tired right now. <laughs> I can't think straight. Us uh, Westerners should have had dinner like two and a half hours ago. Uh, let's uh, move on to the person who is feeling it the least over in California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I guess. The, uh, <laughs> so I guess I'd say. Right at the end. <laughs> All right. So I guess the 1776 Commission report, as well as the last couple of weeks, have all shown us the importance of, I think, civility and more importantly, civics, which is why I'm going to repeat what I said at the last roundtable in that we should all be blaming the STEM fields for stealing all of history's money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all hell. All hell. Yeah. <laughs> We do need to do like a, a another one of these roundtables on just like uh, STEM fetishization. Um, Someone's gonna it's... get a laptop thrown across the room. <laughs> <laughs> God damn! <laughs> I mean, it is it is a, a pervasive issue. Um, I mean, I I uh, used the term at one point. It's actually a term I made up, but like the the whole uh, techno theism thing. Um, you know, and that is, that is pervasive. Um, uh, not just the, you know, I, I love, the, I f love I science folks, but like, you know, beyond that is, it's also this mindset that like technology is driven by science and history is driven by technology. And, you know, the only way we progress is by having better STEM stuff. So, and all this history stuff is just superfluous. That's, that is a huge, huge issue. Um, but, uh, let's, let's move on to, uh, Ms. Beat. Oh yeah. I'll just try to be brief. Thanks for having me again. Uh, and I this this is just an excuse really just to hang out with you all tonight. So, and, to, <laughs> uh, so Mrs. Beat's like, are you about done? She's like, I'm hanging out with the boys, you know? Uh, but yeah, <laughs> but anyway, uh, just to put it bluntly, like what's important to me, of course, is, is building empathy. And I think that's the way forward, like, um, in terms of teaching history, through uh, that goal. Um, and so teaching as many different perspectives as possible and uh, teaching our students also media literacy and, and uh, how to avoid logical fallacies, which uh, several were, I think, uh, I point, pointed several out in the 1776 commission. Um, but yeah, the uh, 1619 project as well had some as well. So I think just being critical and going to as many perspectives as possible um, that's going to be, I think, our best way to get to that goal of empathy and thus survival of the human species. So let's go humans. Yeah. Wow. Human beings. <laughs> I, like, I love wow. humans. No, like just yeah. I like cats so, too. Uh, mine's, mine's running about the place right now. <laughs> um, but, uh, and feel free to interrupt me, guys, if uh, you want to add something to what I'm about to say. But this is uh, it's kind of the conclusion, concluding statement. Uh, the, the, we've talked a lot throughout this. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say before I just summarize what's already been said, um, my piece is that I see this as kind of a, 
like a a lens into the view uh, into Trumpism to uh, a lens into how uh, they think historically. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of history uh, as a methodology is is um, a, is a way to think uh, of thinking. Um, and it really does reveal a lot about somebody um, and their politics by how they describe uh, what should be taught, what should be uh, what should be in the classroom, and all that. How their kids should be uh, uh, taught history, um, or if they should be taught history at all, um, as this you know technotheist stuff goes referencing Grant there, uh, but like the uh the um this also is not just trumpism i i really want to 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 po- to make sure that people think that we're not we're not out of the woods here you know biden is still a neoliberal like every president since ronald reagan has been a neoliberal we've been on this path for 40 years at least um and this is an indicator of how extreme it can get. And while we've been making fun of this document in that, we've seen the very ugly side of that ideology at the Capitol on January 6th. These things are not separate. These things are inherently linked. These are, this is the ideology of the people who attacked the Capitol. Um, this is what the, this is the central thing of what they think needs to be done to make America great again. So when this is not going away, Biden is not really capable. He's too conservative. Um, and I know a lot of people think uh, uh, say Biden's like you know the the um, you know he's a socialist. Ugh, he's I not. wish. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, and uh, the uh, he's not. He's quite conservative, actually. Um, like he would have been like if if uh, Reagan was alive today, Reagan would have been much friendlier with Biden than he would be with Trump. Um, so you know, this is not done. This ideology will continue to grow, continue to spread. Um, unless we start linking it with these events, unless we start critically examining it. Everybody here has thus far said, like, look at the other side. Look at the arguments being said. Like, this whole thing is crazy. So, to wrap up, we've started off talking about the, uh, we started off talking about, like, how to uh, define this, right? Oh, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, that was close. Uh, my, my cat almost knocked over my wine. Um, <laughs> that would have been bad. Uh, and would have knocked it right on my feet. But um, we started off trying to talk about how the riots might be defined, how they connect to the 1776 report, how to view the 1776 report, how it connects to the 1619 report and how, uh, like, how it's trying to answer this whole idea of like un-Americanism and what its ideology shows. I, uh, I hope that everyone comes out of this, not only thinking like, you know, Oh, 1776 report, terrible trash, but also seeing it for more than just a crappy document, but a signification of an ideology and that, that all uh, ideology can't just be forsaken. It needs to be engaged with it. Like everybody has said already, we, we need to acknowledge that this exists and we also need to engage with it critically. Um, so I hope that's the main takeaway from all this. I'll give everybody a chance to like, anybody want to add anything to that before we leave? You said it beautifully. That was, I mean, the, the movement with the wine just added a whole sense of realism to it. It was just, <laughs> Authentic. Cinema verite at its finest. Oh. I cried a little. For watching. We, uh, we appreciate this community on, on here. Yes, and 
So to wrap the, to, to finish it off, uh, thank you everyone for joining me. Thank you, uh, all the viewers here, um, and, and sticking through this three hour voyage, um, you know, three hour tour, um, you know, we might have gotten stuck on Gilligan's Island at some point, but uh, we we eventually got off. Uh, and um, in the description below, there is links to everyone's channel. I hope that you will all go there. Um, and thank you for one last uh, uh, super chat before Just we leave. leave. Um, it's a picture of Wilson. <laughs> Therefore, yeah. opinion is invalid. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Just for the memes. But uh, thank you, everyone, for joining, uh, and have a great night. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye now. Auf Wiedersehen.